Mario's transition into 3D is often credited as one of the best examples of how you can do that. Super Mario 64 is still called one of the best games ever made. I don't think it's that good, but I mean, it's still a great game. From the movement, to the soundtrack, to the decision to make a collectathon platformer, all in all, it just mixed together to make a great experience. Now, that little bit there, being collectathon, is what we're going to be focusing on in today's video, except no we aren't, the videos on Mario Odyssey, but we'll get to that in a moment. Nintendo then started developing a sequel to Super Mario 64, which wasn't Sunshine, you idiot. They're working on Super Mario 64 too. Setting out to release around the year 1999, this game sadly never saw the light of day as it was being made for the Nintendo 64 DD, or disk drive, which, as you might know, failed horrendously. After working on that, they then went on to work on Super Mario Sunshine, which is a lot more mixed of a title. Personally, I'm in the camp that it's a bad game because 100%ing it can be a bit iffy, mainly because there's a lot of jank to the game. While Mario 64 can be glitchy, I mean, you've seen the speedruns, that doesn't happen nearly as much as you might have issues in Mario Sunshine. Similar to its predecessor, Super Mario Sunshine was also a collectathon platformer, featuring collecting 120 things, and then you're done. However, unlike the previous game, you don't need 70 of the collectibles, you need 50. Which, I mean, I'm thankful for, I didn't want to play any more of that game, ha 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 It was after this that things began to change a little with the release of Super Mario Galaxy. Now look, I love Mario Galaxy, probably my favourite 3D platformer Mario funny man, but it was very different to the previous two. Galaxy games were a lot more similar to one of the basic 2D Mario levels, but now in the third dimension, where you have a goal, get there, well done. The game even featured power-ups, which you couldn't really see in 64 and Sunshine unless you want to count the caps or the nozzles. Despite this change, people still saw the game as really good, and even welcomed it. Some even preferring the more linear level structure, which is why we then got a sequel to it in Super Mario Galaxy 2. Also, I find it funny how there was never a planned sequel to Sunshine, well, that we know of at least, but Galaxy got one and 64 was planned to get one. You know, Sunshine just sucks that much. Anyway, Mario Galaxy 2 can be described as just a lot more of the same. If you enjoyed Galaxy's levels, you're gonna enjoy this game. Featuring a little bit more depth with each level hiding a Star Comet medal thing, or when you collect it, you get the Star Comet levels. And then also featuring you having to go back to every single level in the game to find three hidden green stars, which... You know what? I honestly prefer the previous game's idea of just you unlock Luigi, play through the game again, but eh. It is also here that we see the trend of super very hard, difficult, no no likey level at the end of the game, where after you've 100%ed everything else, well maybe not 100% for some of them, but once you've done practically everything else in the game, you unlock a final test level where you're tested on everything you've learned so far. With multiple different power-ups coming back, multiple different elements from previous stages, hazards, enemies, whatever else. Following Galaxy 2, we got Super Mario 3D Land for the 3DS, which is a title that a lot of people now kind of neglect. As I said earlier, Galaxy can be described as a 2D Mario game becoming 3D somewhat. However, 3D Land, and its successor 3D World, which we'll get onto in a little bit, is just full-on 2D Mario levels. It's got Mario getting hit to shrink down to small, it's got mushrooms, all the normal power-ups working the normal way they do. It's quite literally just a 2D Mario game with an additional Z-axis. As I said, this game is often seen as the weakest of the 3D Mario games, which is a bit saddening, especially considering the fact that many people see it as a game that saved the 3DS. Said status is probably why Nintendo decided to make a sequel to it on the Wii U, which was another failing console, but unlike the 3DS, it didn't get redeemed. With 3D World being the fourth game since the last time we saw the collectathon genre being used in 3D Mario titles, people really started to miss it. Mix that together with the lack of collectathon games in general, and the whole genre just kind of poofed. Sure, you had small indie studios starting to develop and make games that fit into that, but people really wanted to see the big ones tackle it again. So even though 3D World did perform really well, there was a lot of people longing for that old style of games, which, luckily with Odyssey, we soon got. Up until the Switch era, I didn't exactly pay attention to video game news, like, at all. If I saw an ad on TV or YouTube or what have you for a game, i pick it up. Simple as, none of this waiting around for its stinkiness. That all changed when I decided to watch the Nintendo Switch presentation in early 2017. I don't remember too much of my reaction to watching it, however, I still distinctly remember 
me seeing Mario Odyssey for the first time. Now, while people knew about the game beforehand with little Switch teasers, bits here and there where you saw it on screen, we didn't actually know what the game was called or any of the main bits of it, which this trailer revealed. It is because of this trailer, because of this game in general, that I got into watching E3s and Directs and what have you. So, all those videos I've made on it, yeah, that's this thing's fault. This trailer showed off a lot of aspects of the game while still keeping a fair amount of things secret. Showing off only four areas, five if you want to include the void at the end, and never even touching upon the whole capturing element. But even with that, we were hooked. You know, theorizing on what the purple coins were, or why there are realistic humans next to Mario, just, there's a lot to talk about. And then, the E3 one dropped. Honestly, the E3 one makes this one seem smelly poopy in comparison, okay? Jump up Superstar playing in the background, all the gameplay being shown off in a more fast, quick-paced way. It was incredible. I was so incredibly hyped up for this game, I even dubbed October of 2017 the month of Mario, stolen from PPG who did the month of Zelda. Now, as you might know, October is also Halloween, so that was a very dumb, idiotic decision, but I mean, it still works as a good way to show just how excited I was. We are currently only three months away from it being five years since this game released. So I feel like now would be a good time to look back on it and see was the hype truly worth it? Was this game as incredible as I and many others believed it was at release and thought it was before release even? Short answer, yes. If you want the long answer, see the rest of this video. And let me tell you, it is a long answer. So now, without any further stuff, let's actually get into the bloody review, which is why you clicked on this video, because that's, that's the name, it's right there. I'm pointing at my screen as if there's something there, but it's completely blank. You can't even see me pointing. I, I don't get why I did that. It's very useless. Anyway, review time. Whoa, okay. Straight into the action then. I, I don't think we've seen Bowser this quickly before since, like, Paper Mario 64. Okay, well, we've seen him, but I don't think we've actually fought him that quickly. You know, honestly, I'm amazed that they made the entirety of Princess Peach's castle, you know, modeled it out, all of that for one cutscene. I mean, they've done it before, but, you know, it's a really in-depth model, you almost think you can run about the thing. Yeah, nice aim, idiot. Wait, since when was Bowser Australian? <laughs> oh, by the way, Mario is dead. I don't even get why you're still trying. You saw him go flying off. Even if he still somehow managed to survive that, he couldn't hear you. <sighs> Bowser, at, at this point, I don't think he can hear you. You know, based off the speed he was going at, he's probably itch million miles away by now. It, it's kind of useless. No! And now we finally get control of Mario. And by that I mean his camera. We, we still don't get to play as the lad himself yet. Honestly, I don't blame them for being scared right now. If I just saw somebody fall down that much and be able to jump back up like everything was fine, I'd be scared too. I mean, if that fall didn't kill him, what will? Anyway, jokes aside, Mario controls really well here. Similar to Super Mario 64, it feels like the levels are built around the movement, which in the case of Mario 64 is, well, actually the case. Anywho, after catching up with the guy, we get told that he is the sibling of the moving tower I neglected to mention earlier. <laughs> And so, with a similar enough goal in mind, the two decide to team up together. And after a quick change of form, because of course, if the person you like doesn't like you at all, you should completely change yourself. Ta-da! Funny Mario hat, back in business, baby! Bonneton, or Hat Kingdom, or Bone Town if you want to pronounce the first name wrong, is where you learn how to play the game. Good wide area for movement, it's got all the objects you're hacking and interact with, not all of them, obviously, but a good amount of them so that you know 
Hmm, if I see thing, throw hat at it. Something cool might happen. It covers your poles, your crates, it even kind of has a triple jump bit. It's good. It also shows off enemies and levers. Not, not in that order, in, in the opposite order, in fact. Just past said enemies is not only a bunch of posters, which why has Bowser put those up? Also, how has he put those up? We saw him put Tiara on Peach's head while Peach is still in her normal dress. So for these to already be here, Bowser would have had to go and grab the dress, put Peach in it, come back and put the posters up. Albeit it very well could have been his minions as they see them about the place. Anyway, so we get to interact with a funny door and enter one of our first sub areas in the game, which tells us that they exist. And then, the big gimmick of this one, other than Cafe, well, it's an element of Cafe, throwing your head at some enemies to capture them. A frog was picked here because Mario is quite well known for jumping and frogs, well, what do they do? They jump. Incredible, truly. We get a funny little cutscene showing him going into the mind of the frog, and then first person perspective as him waking up as one. So that's something. Like, he acts all shocked, and then immediately afterwards, okay, he's just fine. He's just jumping about, moving as normal. Now, already, I can see a problem. See, when you capture this, you get a little thing at the bottom of the screen saying everything you can do. You know, you press this button, here's what its whole thing is. However, below that you can see Shake the Pro Controller to high jump, or Joy-Con, or whatever you're using. Now, why is this an issue? Because I don't want to shake the Pro Controller. Now, to my knowledge, nothing in the game explicitly needs you to shake or use any form of motion control. You know, a lot of the actions can be done by button presses or whatever else, or they just aren't needed and are there for funsies. But they certainly do help. You'll definitely be seeing that later on with our, one of the captures in Esmific Kingdom. I I'll tell you when we get there. So anyway, after missing that coin, which haunts me, and then missing that other one, which is also very annoying. And after failing a jump, which is something you're going to see me do many, many, oh my, so many times we get introduced to this game's replacement for the Koopalings, which can I say, thank you. Like, they're not bad characters, per se. It's just the fact that they have been used so much. You know, like, they're introduced in 3, Super so Mario Bros. 3, and then came back in World, or 4, if you're weird and nobody likes you. Then, you know, we get a little break from them. Then they're back in, I'm pretty sure, Wii. Wii is in New Super Mario Bros. Wii. Then New Super Mario Bros. 2. Also in New Super Mario Bros. U. They're in Mario & Luigi Paper Jam. They're in... Paper Mario Color Splash. They even take up seven slots of Mario Kart 8's roster. And they were in Smash Result costumes. You could not escape them, no matter where you went. And then they were added to Super Mario Maker 2 as well. They're just inescapable. Which is what I basically just said, but you can't escape them no matter where you go. So it is very much a good thing to see replacements for them in the form of the Brutals. Working as the mini-bosses of the game, they're fine. I'll talk about each of them as we get to them, so first of all is Topper who didn't even get the treatment of three hits and they're dead. The whole formula with Nintendo bosses, you know, stomp them three times, do whatever it is three times, they're gone. Not in this situation, it's only twice. They aren't at all a difficult boss. Shut up. The boss also shows us how not all enemies can be captured. We already saw that a bit earlier with the small little Goombas, but we can also see that it affects bigger enemies as well. Also, it, just it being you can't capture bosses, makes sense. Unless you're later on in the game, then you can. And with that, the adventure begins! Oh. So here we are at Cascade, the first proper kingdom of the game. Unlike the previous area, stuff like purple coins and, of course, moons can be collected. But before we can collect said first moon, we all get this change on brain damage. April 2nd? I knew I was slow on getting clips, but I didn't think I was that slow. You know, these moon transitions kind of remind me of how you got- wait, your mother's in this game? Good for her. And here it is, the Odyssey. A little bit worse for wear, other than the globe, somehow, but yeah, seems fine enough. For now, we're gonna neglect said ship, however, because we barely explored any of the area and lacked moons required. I feel now, while I'm failing miserably, is a great time to mention something. See, during the recording of this whole thing, 
My pro controller started suffering from issues with dead zones, you know, when you push a stick in an area, it doesn't register, so I swapped back to my Joy-Cons. Horrible idea, why did I ever think that would be better? Switch back to the pro controller, and eventually I got a new one. So I used three entirely different controllers throughout the whole recording process of this, so if you see me fail, it's mostly because of that. Also because I suck bad. After collecting a few more purple coins and giving more cushions, we finally capture the Yoshi design from Super Mario Bros. The thing sucks control, but luckily we don't have to do that for very long as I accidentally perform a skip which leads us straight to the boss. Madame Brood is an... exist. She's the fifth member of the Brutal family, which we were introduced to in the previous kingdom, and, like them, serves as a boss slash mini-boss. Unlike the previous one we ran into, this one actually takes three hits. Whoa, whoa, back off. Anyway, which doesn't change the fact that she's very easy. And, unlike last time I said that, I didn't get hit like an idiot. And with that, Cascade is done. Except, not really. I mean, I can go to the next kingdom, but A, I skipped a third of the level, and B, after finishing all the story moons in the kingdom, the kingdom opens up with more moons. Such as subspace moons. Little snippets of gameplay that remind me of the stars from Galaxy. Or those floodless sections in Sunshine. More so the floodless sections, as similar to Sunshine, most of them feature two moons in the same way that that featured two giants. Another comparison to Sunshine is that sometimes these are horrendous. For example, this one where you kill all the small things using the big clunky hard to control dinosaur. Lovely. Doing that nets you moon, but how do you get the second one you may ask? Why, by very slowly destroying every destructible object. Except, no it isn't. You actually just need to destroy these ones at the bottom, however, this isn't telegraphed to you whatsoever, so likely, you will destroy all of them like an idiot. Going back to the first area we went to when we arrived at Cascade, we see two new NPCs. These serve as Nintendo's way to try and stop people from looking up where moons are in this game. The first being a blue toad, which sells you the location of moons on your map for 50 coins. If you don't want to do that, then you can go over to the funny amiibo robot, which does the exact same thing, except the price is getting off your lazy hole and grabbing an amiibo from your shelf. Sometimes, as the robot says, you'll get a bonus for scanning certain amiibo. Said bonuses are costumes. Costumes are a brilliant idea. They serve as a great way to shove more references into this game already filled with them. Some of said references are very, very obscure, but we'll get to them when we get to them. Also, can we just take a moment to appreciate an honest-to-god Waluigi reference in a mainline Mario game? We're one step closer to him being playable in one. Any game now. Any game. Oh, there's one. No. no. Following said costume shift, you're most likely to go and collect this moon here, which has no challenge to it bar to press the jump button. Something we've had to do a bunch of times. Next one is slightly less lame as it's in a hidden cave, but it's still just you press one button and you jump, so. Close by to those two dud moons is an actually interesting one. Once again, another new concept is thrown at us with the Scarecrow guys. Throwing Cappy at them opens up these small little platforming segments where, well, you can't exactly use Cappy temporarily. These remind me most of SpongeBob SquarePants Atlantis SquarePants for the Nintendo DS. Oh, also Mario Sunshine, but honestly, who's actually played that game? Next up area is a lot better than the previous one, not only in being better designed, but also in how you can do a funny skip. Now, one big issue with skipping as much of the level as they did is that now this sub area is our introduction to 2D bits in the game. Get it? Bits? Previous games, most notably Galaxy and Galaxy 2, had 2D platforming segments, however, they weren't this 2D. Honestly, as sick as I am with the constant references of the first Mario via sprite reuse, this doesn't anger me, and is honestly quite a cool concept. If it was just 3D Mario in a 2D obstacle course like Galaxy, it wouldn't fit into the world as smoothly. But with these only taking up a two-dimensional plane, you can shove them literally anywhere, and it doesn't interfere with the level that much, bar a weird pixelated pipe. This area features some pretty well-hidden purple coins and a secret moon, as is to be expected with any sub-area. Oh, and also a normal one. This idiotic mistake is actually an ingenious way to show you the teleport system in the game. Simply press minus to go to any previously unlocked flag. Or the Odyssey once we actually get that up and running. Oh, also you can't do it when you're jumping or falling. Who any? Here's what was supposed to be the first 2D segment. 
Uh, there isn't anything noteworthy here except for a moon hidden in the right corner. After another time challenge thing, focusing on the triple jump and my first death, which I didn't think we'd get to so quickly, I grab the final moon here for now and begin making my way to the funny shit. However, as you can see, I haven't gotten all of the purple coins yet, so I poke white for them. I find the second last batch, thanks to low render distance, and the last batch with an amiibo. In this game, certain amiibo will allow you to do certain things. The only one I actually care about and know well enough about is the Bowser amiibo, which, when used, reveals the location of a singular purple coin. What annoys me is that I knew about this area where the purple coins were. I just didn't think that the purple coins themselves would be there because, well, that's where that painting-shaped canvas is. And with that, the Odyssey is restored to its presumably former glory. I don't know, man. Maybe it didn't look like that before. I mean, like, what are the chances that the thing was actually red? Anyway, we can now reach the next kingdom in the game. First, though, we gotta cause some damage. And look, the things in the air. Incredible. We even receive a little captain's hat, which doesn't have an outfit to go with it, so it's kind of... Annoying. Just a little bit. Who cares though? We finally get to leave the tutorial areas of the game. Right? I don't like sand. Wow. Thanks for the info, Cappy. Seeing as I'm not a more and I won't be needing the action guide, but thanks anyway. I sure do hope this is the one and only time you bring up stuff like this. But before we can go there, we gotta go back to Hat Kingdom. Unlike when we first went here, both moons and purple coins are now available to be grabbed. Said purple coins are in the shape of little top hats. I like how it changes depending on the region. Even with the various changes to the area, it's still in ruins, which is to be expected and will be gone for five minutes. Another thing that's changed about the region is that there are now more enemies here. Well, one singular new type of enemy. But hey, we can actually capture it, so let's see what it is. Oh, Power Goomba. Nice. They can fly a certain distance above the ground that they are at, but no higher than that. However, if you start off in a really high area, like say the top of the tower, and fly off a bit like that as the Power Goomba, it stays at that height. The timer challenges we saw earlier have also been added to this kingdom. This one is quite different, as unlike the previous two we saw in Cascade Kingdom, this one is it just summons one singular platform for me to be on, and mostly focuses on the already created terrain to be the main challenge. Also similarly to Cascade, since the kingdom is done, well, when it comes to all story objectives anyway, some sub-areas have opened up, such as this one at the top of the tower, which we saw was blocked by rubble earlier. I've seen a lot of complaints about the sub-areas that look similar to this because, you know, it's just a bunch of orange and blue blocks all about the place and doesn't really have too much detail. However, with how well they are designed most of the time, I can't really complain. Now, notice I said most of the time? Yeah, I end up clipping through this one. But don't you worry, I masterfully saved myself from death. Or not, oh. At the top of the tower, we find Captain Toad. You know, the, the dude from Galaxy. Here he gives us a moon, as we'll be seeing him quite often. The next sub-area features the Power Goomba, which we were just introduced to, but expands on their ability of movement a lot more. Here you have to go up and go down to make sure and try and collect all of the moon shards, which is a brand new thing introduced here as well. Moon shards essentially function like the silver stars from Mario Galaxy or Super Mario 64 DS. Collect a certain amount of them, in this game it is five, and you get a full-on moon. These can be found in main areas, but most of the time you will be seeing them in sub-areas. The secret moon here is garbage. Okay, like, I don't understand who thought it'd be a good idea of- Oh hey, let's make the person go to the highest that the power Goomba can go, which isn't very high mind you, float over to a block, wait for the Goomba to fall down, which doesn't take that much time, but still having to do it each time racks up, you know? Then do it all over again till they're at the very top. Now, you don't have to bring the Power Goomba, you can just get rid of him and then try and grind and find your way up or something like that, but with how incompetent I am, I didn't bother. Speaking of things that suck, so does the next sub area. Like, I'm not too big a fan of the frogs, I nearly mentioned this earlier, but they just move really slowly on the grind even while holding down the go faster button and are really slow in the air, and when the key main thing that they're doing is jumping and they're bad at that, then you've done a real terrible job, right? So, you know those purple coins we've been getting? You know, we find them in Cascade, we're finding them here at Funny Hat Kingdom, presumably we're gonna find them in a lot of other kingdoms, yeah, well, you see, they actually do have a purpose, they're not just collect X amount of Y, well done, good for you. You use them to buy region-specific goods, which is a nice little thing. You can purchase the aforementioned costumes, and you can also purchase a bunch of random knickknacks for the Odyssey. If you ever have been on holiday somewhere, 
you have probably bought some random stuff from a store or a stall to try and remember your travels. Be it a crummy t-shirt or a snow globe or some fridge magnet of, like, the shape of the area that you're in, you've most likely bought something. Normal coins can also be used to purchase stuff, unlike most Mario games. Here you can purchase those hearts that give you additional three hit points. Uh, moons, which, trust me, are gonna be knowing a lot about that very much later. And additional costumes. Here we are at the Sand Kingdom. For real this time, we don't have to go anywhere else, we can actually explore here. The first one we ever saw from this game, way way back when it was teased alongside this place. Unlike normal sand places, this one is red, so it's unique. It's also frozen, which is a concept I'm starting to get sick of now. The first area you're likely to explore when arriving here is Toasterina Town, which is, well, as the name might suggest, a town. There's a couple things to do here, but some of them are limited to after you've completed the main mission here. Once said things have been opened up, we will be returning. Following the big glowy beam leads us towards some ruins. Said ruins feature the introduction of a new type of enemy, this being the Bullet Bill. The ruins have been essentially built around this enemy, and it teaches you all the main things it can do. It can help you travel across gaps, break blocks, and it appears from blasters. Now, some would think the most logical next step is to continue going through the ruins and eventually up the tower to, you know, do the thing that the game wants you to do. However, I am not normal. Instead, I jump in the funny sinkhole. This leads us to a new sub-area which completely contrasts everything that we see outside of it. They go for a full-on ice level down here. Most things are just ice or bits of ruins. Of course, as most things are ice, which sadly includes the floor, we have to deal with good old ice physics. Don't you love your character slipping and a sliding around? Yeah, it's not that big of an issue in this game. There's only one moon here, which I feel is really strange, because the place where it's been put is you have to wall jump up these moving pillars to grab it, so it just feels like that'd be where you'd put your secret moon than have the normal one by the pipe, but who am I to judge? The game already has 880 moons anyway. It doesn't exactly need more. Going through the pipe, which you'd think would logically lead back to somewhere near the sinkhole, takes us to a completely different area way away from it. I mean, I'm not gonna complain, it gives us an additional moon on access to Jaxi, so that's something. Jaxi is a very fast thing that helps you get around the desert until you get warps, which are just better. Like, he is cool, but for the most part, everything in the desert circles around areas where there's a warp place, so other than like the occasional moon here or there, you're not exactly gonna need Jaxi to run out and grab it. Now, Entering this sub-area is funny, as for the second time in this video, I accidentally reveal a mechanic we were supposed to be introduced in the main story earlier than intended. Well, technically last time I was a skip. This new mechanic is the form of a new capturable enemy. I know we were just introduced to one, but here's another. This being the Moai. Press a button, now I can see the things are invisible. Take the glasses off by pressing the button again and it's, you can't see it anymore, that, that's it. All things considered, it is kind of lame one, especially in comparison to the others, but have a lot more stuff you can do with them. Other than one example we'll get to later, this isn't exactly used well. Hey, remember that flag I activated earlier back when I was, you know, actually going through the ruins and doing the main mission? Cringe, I know. Yeah, if you were back there, you might notice a small little dent in the wall. A little gap that if Mario was very, very flat, he could probably make it under. Well, lucky for us, you can make it under there if you just allow the sand to consume you. I like to pretend this is a nod to that one secret in New Super Mario Bros. DS or Paper Mario Sticker Star, but let's be honest, it is not. After two more 2D segments, both of which involving the Bill of Bill, with one of them being on a flat surface like we've seen before, and another one being on a completely cylindrical surface, which I think is pretty cool, we reach the glowy thing which is a moon. Yay. The next objective is much closer this time, and has a conveniently placed platform leading to it directly from the tower. While riding said platform, we get introduced to two new things Cappy can interact with. These being the Flingy Boys, and the Ring of Fire Making Boys. I don't know the names. The Ring of Fire ones are a cool concept where once you hit Cappy against it, then it summons a, well, what do you expect? Ring of Fire, which can destroy blocks and hurt Mario. It can also activate other flamey ring boyos, which is not a good thing, because then you can enter a feedback loop where one gets activated, another, then another, then another, back and forth, and back and forth. When you finish the platform ride and actually make it to the plateau it was going to, you find out that, oh my god, it's really boring over here. This is where you're supposed to get introduced to Moais, and it's really sad. 
The majority of the moon shards, which you have to collect here, don't even involve having to use the Moai for Christ's sake. This opens up the uh, inverted pyramid. Huh. So that's why they chose Illumination. But before getting to explore that really cool looking area, we first gotta rind up some sheep. Wow, I sure do hope this isn't a recurring moon. Haha. -ha. In a reference to Mario 64, once you've gotten your reward out and can easily grab it at any time, you can murder the poor innocent animals you just helped save. Great touch, Nintendo. Thanks. Okay, right, now I'll enter the big scary pyramid. The whole gimmick of this place is gravity flipping, which they shamelessly stole from Galaxy 1. After a brief exterior 2D platforming bit, which well illustrates my earlier point of this 2D way being better, and after coaxing a bullet bill to smash its head against a wall, then go through said gap in the walls we can capture and get across a gap, we finally reach the top, uh, bottom, where the boss fight is. Harriet is probably my favorite one of the five brutals, not not because of that you pervert, but because of the fact that you can make the fight go a lot faster by, get this, doing stuff. Instead of waiting for purple bombs, just hit the funny blue ones back. Instead of waiting for them to go bite in their flying hat saucer thing, just hit the balls back up to them. A very good lesson for life, I know. After repeating this three times, we get the multi-moon, so well done, Cappy, we saved the day. Oh, why is it floating? Oh, great! We turned off the sun! That's just amazing. Honestly, that sounds like a perfect time to go and buy a new outfit. Said outfit is a cowboy one, which appears to be referencing Mario Party 2's western board. Oh, also, fun fact, cursed nights are a great time to go hit up the slots. Okay, fine, I'll go to the big scary upside down pyramid, even if the desert is infected with these really annoying mummy enemies you can't use Cappy to dispose of. Oh! Good. More ice. Exactly what we need. But you know what? I can't really complain here as we get introduced to Goombas. You know, the enemy nobody knows about. With Goombas being the first enemy Ari ever comes up against and being arguably the most recognizable one, it makes sense to see them here and the game wouldn't feel whole if he wasn't. Unlike the smelly yellow ones from earlier, these ones we can actually capture this time. Great. Goombas do two things. A. Walk in ice without slipping and sliding. Something that comes up so very rarely that it barely matters, and B, stack. Goomba stacking is used here to grab a moon and a handful of purple coins that Mario wouldn't have been able to reach by himself. Moving on to the next room leads us to a giant arena shaped circle. You know, let's go over there. A boss? Who could have foreseen this? Not a fan of this dude, to be honest. Though punching him in the face is very much funny, it's just not too fun of a fight. As I said earlier with Harriet, I'm a fan of bosses where you can actually speed up the fight, and this dude, I haven't figured out any way to do that yet. You must wait for him to summon his ice, wait for him to do all of his other things, and when he finally gets to the point where he's got his hand shaking above you like those annoying enemies from Zelda to smack down, then, and only then, can you capture his hand, then move on to the next phase of the fight. But it's not even when he smacks his hand down, no, you have to make sure that you're lingering above some ice. Because if you don't do that, then, well, you've messed up. And with that, we're actually done for realsies this time with the Sand Kingdom. Well, done in the sense that we can leave. I won't be doing that though. I mean, after all, we've still got purple coins and moons to grab, such as the moon for harassing this bird or for grind pointing, which is barely a step up from the moon for jumping. We get to capture another classic enemy here, this being little Kitu, who just wants to fish and, presumably, grill. Get the big fish, get a moon. Fishing in any game is a sign that it's one of the best games ever made, obviously. Here we're introduced to another new moon type, being note moons. Touch all the notes to get a moon. Uh, we've seen these notes in Mario Galaxy, where you collect them and you get like a 1-up or, I don't know, a coin or something. After fishing Captain Toad out of some sand, which, of course, why wouldn't he be down there? And rolling a lot better than Sonic will in Frontiers. We get introduced to another new moon type. Sad moon type being the minigame moons. Simply do the minigame, do it again much later on in the game, you get a moon for both times. This one is quite simple, just walk in a circle, 
Heck, if your Joy-Cons are busted enough, Mario probably automatically did this one for you. Here you see me epically throw something into a pot. Now, this is a new type of moon, being the pick up a seed and put it in a pot moon. Christ, that needs a better name. So, you get this seed, put in pot, it grow, you get moon. Truly incredible. I'd recommend trying to find all the seeds first before you go about hunting all the moons because they take a while to grow sometimes. Most of this video will be entirely focused on Mario Odyssey as it launched, only really get into the additional bits at the very end. However, seeing as I accidentally stumbled upon one of these additional things added to the game, I might as well explain them. Essentially, Nintendo added a bunch of pixelated things about the place that would give you coins if you find them. They had released screenshots similar to that of the art moons, which we'll get to eventually, which showed you an area, go find area, grind pound, I pops a chap, gives you coins. Hey, remember Jaxie from earlier? Yeah, well, apparently used to be a statue, and has statue friends. Or maybe he never was a statue and is just friends with inanimate objects like some sort of weirdo. Anyway, the main reason why I'm talking about this is because it's another new moon type. Whoa! I I'm gonna call these NPC moons as you get them from, right? helping an NPC. Speaking of Jaxie, if we enter that place below where we first find him, we get taken to a new sub-area where the floor will kill you dead unless you use Jaxie. It's fine. Nothing really of note here. Right, so, hey, remember that painting-shaped canvas from earlier? Right, well, get, get this, right? This one isn't broken. These paintings take you to secluded areas of kingdoms you are either yet to visit or have already visited to grab a move. They always come with a flag, so if you ever want to come back to this area, which most of the time you don't if you've already gotten the moon, you can. In this case, it's a kingdom we haven't been to yet, but don't worry. Soon enough, you will get to see it. I mean, I say soon enough, it's probably gonna be in five million hours, but still. Also, theoretically, you could call this another new moon type. <laughs> One big issue with seed moons that I didn't mention earlier, as that seed was right next to the pod, is that Mario's movements are really restricted while carrying one. You can't roll, or dive, or long jump, or sneeze, and it just takes so long to traverse where you are to get to the pods. This next sub-area is one of the ones that really nails down the whole uh, Super Mario Sunshine sub-area themes, where it's in the middle of nowhere, and you can't use the main gimmick of this game. This one's quite easy unless you want to go for the purple coins, then it's not fun. Okay, well, it's fun, just difficult. Returning to the top of the tower at the ruins, we get introduced to the fifth new capturable enemy in this area. This is the Glidon, who, as you might be able to guess from the name, does your taxes for you. Next sub-area, if you can even call it that, as it just consists of one room, is pretty lame. Essentially, you feel the vibrations, and when it's just right, you pine. Oh yeah, by the way, there's a Sphinx in this game, so that's, uh, something. He asks you riddles, and then you answer them, and then you get a moon for answering them, and then he asks some more of them. And then you answer some more of them, and then you're done for this kingdom. Right, last sub-area, really cool one, where you can cheese it by going on top of the walls. Sadly, Nintendo actually knew about this one, hence the coins. And, after one last shopping spree and another new type of moon, this being outfit room moons, I'm running out of names for these, we're done with the sand kingdom. For now. Except not really, as we've got to wait for the plants. Gray. Two thousand years later. Right, well, seeing as I get to have a choice between these two kingdoms, might as well pick the one that is suckier. I don't like this kingdom. The purple coins are scales, I think. The moons are pink. Main captures are zips and cheap cheeps and I'm bored already. Okay, the kingdom isn't that bad, but it's just so simple compared to the other small kingdoms so far. I'm sorry, but compare this kingdom, which is a small pond and a lake, to what we got in Cascade Kingdom, or the Funny Hat Kingdom, and, you know, it just kind of sucks in comparison. However, sucks in comparison doesn't exactly mean that it's straight up bad. I mean, there are some pretty cool bits here. For example, the part where you have to go down to the depths of Well to meet Captain Toad for a moon. Or the whole underwater building aesthetic they kind of got. So, you know what Dry World from Mario 64? Negative aura jokes aside, remember how the skybox looked like an underwater city? Yeah, why didn't we get that in this kingdom? Imagine swimming through abandoned houses and stores and whatnot as a cheap cheap, you know? Like, that would have just been way better than this dinky little place. I mean, it still does look alright, but it's just, if you compare what could have been to this, 
yeah, there's a bit... No. Gotta love, though, how even with the building so small, they still managed to fit a shop in here. I honestly had no clue the demand for hats was that high. I mean, like, does the Mushroom Kingdom and the rest of the world, apparently, go through phases? Like, in Sticker Star, we saw everybody get addicted to stickers. Next two games, gone, okay? And they do take place after each other, as shown in The Origami King. And yet still, gone. Nothing, you know? And now we've, here we've got the funny hats, where everybody wears a hat, and there's a bunch of hat stores about the place, and then that's just gonna be gone inexplicably in the next game. Unless the next game is Super Mario Odyssey 2, which I hope it is. Uh-oh, spoilers for my overall impressions, uh-oh. Anyway, what were we talking about? Oh yeah, Lake Kingdom. What is there to actually talk about, though? You can kill a Goomba with a Goomba. That's fun. Also in that same general area is another warp painting which takes us back to Sand Kingdom with our own miniature inverted pyramid. Oh yeah, here's one. Uh, for once, a sub-area is open prior to completing the kingdom. And boy, let me tell you, this one's pretty good. It makes good use of the spinny spring things we've been introduced to, as well as crawling against walls, and shows us that fuzzies are in this game. Come on, everybody loves those things, right? Right? I, I legitimately have no clue what the general consensus on them are. The secret moon is also quite well hidden. I mean, sure, I found it straight away, but this is like my third time playing this game. Of course, I can remember some of these, especially one like that, where it's a nice hidden one where you go, yeah, no, that that's funny, that makes sense. All right, third brutal time. In my notes, I wrote Koopaling. That's really, really sad. Rango is a funny, goofy man. Phase one is easy enough, just press Y, hit the hat, jump on hat, hit that, head. And now you're on to phase two, which can be difficult if you're an idiot. Luckily for me, I'm not an idiot this time. As always, time challenges and additional sub-areas are now available. The only sub-area of note is this block puzzle one, which I spent an embarrassing amount of time trying to figure out. Before heading off, I pop into the store to grab some fashionable clothes, which is a reference to a 2014 Japan-only new Nintendo 3DS commercial. Because, I mean, of course it is. Oh yeah, also I forgot to put this in earlier because I'm an idiot, but the tuxedo outfit appears to be a reference to uh, Super Mario All-Stars. And some less fashionable clothes, which are obviously what you're only allowed to wear when you want to go and look at a dress. I I'm sorry, but I don't get why they say, oh, you're gonna need proper swimwear for this room when it's one of the ar areas in the kingdom which isn't water. I, I don't get it. And with that, let's head to the kingdom with great music that reminds me of Smash 64. After being taught how to throw Cappy. Seriously, Nintendo, I, I did not need these. The first one, you know what, fair enough, it tells you where the action guide is. If I ever forget something, I can have a look at that, but throughout the entire game, you already have little windows appear in the bottom right that shows you what to do if you get stuck. You do not need to have Cappy every time I go to New Kingdom tell me, Oh, by the way, did you know you can jump? Yeah, crazy concept for games I know, but like, you can go up and then go back down. Hole. Now this is a sub-area. It's got everything you need. Seeds, Goombas, and the dinosaur you undoubtedly thought we were never gonna see again. This time, however, they look a lot more awake and are incredibly mean. What the hell was that? No, seriously, like, did they specifically code it to be like that? AI coded to be insufferable aside, there's some cool stuff down here, like this boulder. Or this tree. You can capture the dino, but it's really irritating to do so. You have to wait around, dodge all of its attacks, and pray to whoever you see fit that whenever they do the charge attack, you are standing near a concussionable object. Worst part is, I didn't even break the correct blocks with it, so I just completely wasted my time there. Woo! After grabbing another Wear X costume moon, we get to enter the pipe maze. It blows! Now, I don't know why I heard this, but I believe Mario is supposed to look towards the pipe you're supposed to go to, but come on. Let's be honest, that's such a minor thing that in the event it even is true, nobody's going to notice it. Most, if not all, will just go trial and error, like me. The next one sucks less as it's the simple timer challenge one. The moon after that, though, is perhaps the worst moon 
in this game. To grab said Mario and Luigi Bowser's Inside Story plus Bowser Jr's Journey Moon, you must 1. Capture the money bag. 2. Have 500 coins to waste. And 3. Hold down Y for approximately 1 minute and 48 seconds. Okay, maybe not approximately. That's how long it took for me starting to hold down the button to when the moon actually popped out. A treasure made from coins. I'm gonna find the person who pitched this moon. I'm gonna make a treasure from their skull. Anyway, I think it's time to say goodbye to that area and go explore the other 90% of the kingdom. And what better way to do so than spend cash and answer riddles? Mix that with mechanic outfit and I don't think there's any way we could be more in theme with this kingdom. Now, usually the last sentence would have been a funny haha -ha sarcasm moment. However, the Steam Gardens is an area where wearing a mechanics outfit entirely fits. I mean, it's gardens and mechanics. What more could you want? Poison? You want poison? We've got poison. I mean, hey, you know, you can't have a forest without poison. That's probably a saying in the Mario universe is, you know, a lot of the forests, there's poison in them. Now, I must ask you this question. What is better than rising water and fuzzies separately? Why, leprosy, of course. Decently enjoyable, nice hidden moon, overall pretty... Okay, I got it this time. Might as well talk about these upward fellas. They become tall and can reach things Mario normally can't. Piranha plants are in this game too, by the way. You can catch them for no reason at all. Not the big ones, though. Wait, Sky Garden? Before heading off to that tower, I'll just grab this moon here. More like cracked, not uncumbling tower. <laughs> in we go. This sub area is all right. Final brutal time, and this one is easier than breathing. And yet I still managed to mess up. Just hat, jump, repeat said thing three times, and they're myrtled. After that, we get access to speed flowers. Simply throw copy at them, and away you go. Oh, also tanks exist now. They are slow as hell. Oh yeah, before continuing, the scientist man is a reference to a Super Game Boy commercial, because why not? Do you like fog and pyro goombas? No, then you won't like here. <laughs> the next moon is also Goomba related, but features catfishing. Anyways, after another nut and sub area with Goombas, we get to the top of this kingdom. From there, we can go finish a kingdom, or I could miss this nut. Okay, boss time. This fella looks more like a Pikmin boss than a Mario one, but either way, three hits and they're deader than Blockbuster. Oh, correction, three hits and they're deader than Alpha Dream. Hey, remember earlier when I said that this was the top of Wooded Kingdom? Well, I lied. Here there is an entrance to the sub area with enough coins to put NSB2 to shame and a glide on. But before I can use them, I have to quickly grab this nut. Glide on helps take us to Captain Toad, and using the nearby pipe brings you back to the observation deck, which also gives us a glimpse of some areas below. Now, a wise man would use this knowledge to cheat his way into some moons. However, I am not a wise man, as I literally walk past where I need to go and die. The painting takes us to an unforgettable kingdom we are yet to visit. And yeah, all that's left now is to do the two timer challenges and get the hell out of here. God, I am so excited for Metro Kingdom. I've been wanting to talk about this place since 2017. Not even going to complain about the useless tutorial bit this time. Wait, wait, wait uh, what? Are we fighting Bowser? I thought they would have saved that for the end, but no, here we are in Clyde Kingdom? Well, if rules land can be a board, I guess this can be a kingdom. Before I fight though, I must get into the proper attire. Pretty decent fight. Even if Bowser's just copying Mario's gimmick like he's done so many other times. Deal his hat, punches that, and you're good as gold. So what, do we just grab Peach or uh-oh, 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 uh-oh. Huh? 
Oh boy, a new kingdom to explore. Let me just get into the proper attire first. Or not, I guess. Well, guess we're stuck staring at Mario's nips for now. Okay, how was I supposed to see that? Christ, could this day get any work? You know what? He kind of deserves it for forcing me through all those bloody tutorials. Seeing as this kingdom is the first to have this problem, other than technically Cap Kingdom, I might as well discuss it here. Now, as you might have noticed, the moons here are the same color as the ones in Cascade Kingdom. Now, like, this just doesn't really make too much sense to me. Spoilers for later on in the game, but when you return to Cloud Kingdom and the moons are the same color there, it makes sense there's only like four there, but this kingdom is about as large as Lake Kingdom, and that kingdom got its own moon color, so why didn't this one? Like, I get this is a really small nitpick to have about the game, but still, it's just kind of annoying, you know? Anyway, so we got Cappy back, which sucks, I know, but hey, now I can capture these wiggler things. They make funny accordion noises. Honestly, there's not much to talk about here, and I don't mean that in a negative way, it's just that this kingdom is alright enough. Fine music, fine design, fine captures, it's all just fine. The only real standout bits are here, where you get to see a challenge done in two different dimensions to show how it's designed differently. And, I guess, these explodey chaps. Oh, actually, also these two purple coins in front of the waterfall. I like where they're hidden. It's a really good way to make use of the kingdom being surrounded by purple poison, this liquid, which of course it is. In the same way, you can't have a forest without poison, you can't have a jungle without poison. Yeah. Oh, hey look, some form of civilization. Now we can stop staring at Mario's nips. For now, this outfit is a nice little callback to Super Mario Land, which all things considered, doesn't really get much attention to it. I mean, like, if not for Daisy, literally nobody would care about that game. Except for maybe the Super Balls. In fact, that might be more of a reason why people care about it than Daisy. Okay, new donk time. It's crazy how powerful these moons are, especially considering how many are just laying about. Someone should seriously take advantage of them. Like, Bowser went out of his way in Galaxy to steal the power from a comet spaceship thingy. When he could have just went and grabbed some moons, man. What's stopping him? Why is everything covered in pee? Hey Mario, did you know that you can wall jump by pressing- oh, yeah. Finally, New Donk City. At night. This area, as you might have guessed from the name, is seen vaguely around Donkey Kong. And when I say Dinky Kink, I don't mean the country. I mean the real old one. They even brought Pauline into the game, a character which previously only really showed up in the Mario vs. DK games, as well as some quite old commercials. Oh, by the way, the city is infested with these maggot things, so sorry entomophobiacs. It's also infested with tanks, so sorry to all you armamachophobiacs out there. What is that name? Christ, Bowser really went all out advertising. The venue has got to be in a pretty large and convenient location for him to be going like this. Also, you gotta admire the work ethic of the people employed at the funny hat shop, because look around, look at the crazy stuff happening, and yet the store is still open, you can still buy your funny outfits. Cheers for all the help tank, but your services are no longer required. Alright, time to head into the big main building. This place has gotta be looking real nice for it to be the whole centerpiece of the area. I, uh, I, I see they went for a sort of open plan thing here. I, I don't think it quite fits. Also, why is there posters in here? Like, Bowser, man, I get it, you want everybody to know you're getting married, but I'm pretty sure the 50 million billboards outside did the job for you more than enough. Wait, why is there an actual treasure chest in here? Like, I get, I get there needing to be a moon there for gameplay purposes and what else, but you could've just had it floating there. Yo, hey, could you stop terrorizing- This boss is a pretty simple but pretty fun one. I say simple as this fight is essentially a Wiggler fight. You know how these things go if you've played any of the Mario Luigi games. E except Partners in Time. It's really weird in that one. At the same time, it's not quite Wiggler, so... Oh yeah, they can also open portals. Because, of course they can. All Wigglers have that ability, they just choose not to use it. But robotic ones, they do. They have no morals. Alright, two hits down, one to go or not. Oh. I see you've been learning from the funny hat man in the first kingdom.
And with that, New Donk City is restored. Also, it's daytime now, so that's twice Mario has meddled with the Earth's rotation. Good for him. The painting takes us back to Steam Gardens. Oh, by the way, make sure to remember all of these. They're a surprise tool to help us later. Also, also, can I just say it was very bold of Nintendo to make Mario manlet. See, it's just kind of outside the box thinking that really sets him apart from the competition. New Donk City is one of my favorite locations in the game. I mean, the music, the design are just impeccable and... New Donk City is one of my least favorite kingdoms in the game. Hey, remember the seed moons from earlier? Yeah, well, this kingdom decides to kind of shift them up a little. Instead of there being a designated, you know, pot area where you know where to bring the seeds to, the seeds are there, I need to go out and find the pots. I find these ones a lot more enjoyable than the ones we had back in Sand Kingdom. Although that could be because there's a lot less space between the seeds and the pots. These make quite good use of Mario's limited movement in a not knowing way, but come on, who cares about that? You can become a manhole cover and Fortnite Jonesy, but all I can do is him is just drive this stinky little cart ride, so. All right, all right, let's go do main mission stuff. After I abuse this corpse. And also be a giant prick. And gamble, okay, I'm done now. And become a taxi. Look, I'm sorry, but there's just a bunch to do in this kingdom, including meeting up with Captain Toad, who is standing a bit too close to that edge there. So anyway, commerce, am I right? Look at Mario in that spiffy new outfit, which is clearly a reference to Super Mario Maker for the 3DS. We'll also buy this funny golf outfit, because hopefully we'll be able to completely remove the memory of what we just witnessed by doing so. And for good measure, we'll also buy the fedora so that that way Mario can post on Reddit. Okay, let's progress the bloody game now. Hey Mario, well done on existing and whatnot. Can you go get four musicians for me? I can't seem to find any. There's one. Whoa, yeah, we did it. That was difficult. Ooh, there's another one. Uh, again? Are, are we supposed to do this again? A, a third time. These guys aren't even that hard to find. They're literally marked on the map. Okay, that's the last member now. Great. And there's electricity problems. Just, just perfect. Actually, you know what? It is perfect, because we get to capture a bigger manhole cover. The main gimmick here are these spinny platform things. I mean, they're cool enough, they're used in an alright way, but I don't know. Alright, that's the machine fix, I guess. I wonder how it works. Oh! It's the thingy I suggested earlier. We can go start the festival now, but first, I gotta get into the proper attire. The festival is one giant love letter to the original Conky Dong, and it's because of that I picked- Ow! Because of that I picked this outfit. Nintendo wanted to make this memorable, and I definitely say they've done so. From the looks, the amazing song in the background, to the final bit being incredibly similar to the first level of Donkey Kong, it all makes for just a really enjoyable segment. Heck, they even made a custom moon get sign. There's a couple more things to do here before we leave, such as meet up with these chaps I neglected to mention earlier. One of the big new things added to the kingdom now are these funny scooter boyos, which allow Mario to cause traffic issues 500% more efficiently. But, most importantly, it allows us to park here. Strangely enough for the first ones to go here, but I don't really get it as this is a proper quality spot. I have a very important question for you. Do you like Donkey Kong, King of Swing? Well, this is kind of vaguely basically that. Really like the hidden moon here too, as well as this one where you just sit with this dude. This moon gets a lot of flack, but I don't really understand why. Like, sure it's simple, but it's a really nice moment. This sub area is quite cool as you stupidly assume nothing crazy is gonna happen when- OH GOD! 
I missed a coin! Alright, one last sub area before we leave, and this one involves climbing as well as a well placed hidden moon. One Oscar purchase later, and yep, yeah, I'd say we're done with this kingdom. For now, once more we are given the choice of which kingdom to go for first, and seeing as he'd much rather freeze to death than burn to death, I think I'm gonna go with Snow Kingdom. After being taught the Grand Mind Jump, which, you know what, in all fairness, it's a new move to this game, people might not discover it. I'll let them have this one. But so far the rest of them have been incredibly stupid, so. Christ. They weren't lying about the snow. I'm pretty sure you're not able to actually do anything on here until the main story objective is complete, so for now, sadly, we're gonna have to stick to it. One cool thing to note, though, before we go down the big scary hole is that the blizzard doesn't actually render through the ice, so you can see little bits of the kingdom. Shiveria is essentially the Toastarina town of this kingdom. It's the little pocket of civilization surrounded by the chaos. The great music, atmosphere, and this fun little skip you can do makes this location a really memorable one. The thing Bowser stolen from this kingdom is a cake, which... Bowser, you literally have captured Princess Peach, the world-renowned caker. This wasn't really necessary. Though, at the same time, maybe you just didn't want to force her to make her own wedding cake. So, it could be that, or it could be it's just incredibly stupid. Either way, it was not necessary to also block up the race course. To unblock said location, you've got to go around to all four of the sub-areas in this general, well, area, and grab the moon at the end of them. In this first one, we see the return of a beloved enemy, the Taifu, from Super Mario 3D World. They are now capturable, so you can blow to your heart's content. Oh, also the uh, Spinies return, I guess, but let's be honest, who actually knows those enemies? They're not nearly as iconic. Sadly, this sub-area blows. Seriously though, it's not actually that fun. The next one is a fair bit better though, and serves as an introduction to these upward blowy things. Yeah, it's also the first time we see a boss get reused, this being Rango from earlier. The only major difference to watch out here is the slippery ice, as it can trip you up. That's not what tripped me up though, it was me just not hitting the other hat. Look, you know the drill by now, unless you're Mecha Wiggler or Topper. Three hits and they perish. The next sub-location really reminds me of that one star in Mario 64 in the igloo. I think it was in, what, Snowman's Land? It focuses on these guys that are reminiscent of that one enemy from Super Mario 3D Land or 3D World. I don't know which it's from, I just remember seeing them in Paper Jam. The last one sees the Goomba's inability to slip on ice become somewhat useful. I mean, I say somewhat because ice isn't that annoying of a mechanic to deal with, and also I'm pretty sure this is the last time in the game you even see it be brought up or used at all, so... Yeah. Alright, that's the way opened up. Before heading down though, I think we better get Mario into something more suited for this climate. This allows us to enter a really fun 2D bit in one of those specific outfit rooms from earlier, except now we're actually getting a sub area alongside it instead of. With the track now open, the Shivarians can finally get back to their races, or at least they could if not for this loser. Luckily, sucking bad is something that body snatching can fix. This allows us to enter the bind bowl tournament thing, and it is very interesting to say the least. Essentially, pressing B or shaking the controller, if you're a maniac, gives you a little bit of a boost if you do it at the right time. It takes a bit to get used to, but eventually you will get used to it. The race you have to do is easy enough, and you'll probably get it done the first try. Even if you didn't really do that much of the tutorial thing they gave you beforehand, you'll still be fine, because you've got three laps to learn. Alright, let's claim the moon and get over with this here kingdom soon! With the main objective complete, we can actually explore the Bloody Kingdom. Crazy concept, I know. There's a decent amount to do here, such as this reprise of the walking minigame from earlier where the only main difference is the shape and the ice physics, or summon and jump across these ice platforms, or swim in ice water. You can also- wait, what's happening? Every copy of Super Mario Odyssey is personalized. I know this because whenever I play the game, I play it in a different way than when you play the game. 
Therefore, because our experiences are different, the game is personalized to me. This kingdom actually has a third capture, this being the grape flavored cheap cheap. They are the same as the cheap cheaps from earlier, but now they're purple. One of the sub areas sees you recreate the Bible by walking on water, like Luigi. So that's a plus. And the same sub area is this one bit at the end, which is really reminiscent of Galaxy 2 and like one of the Yoshi levels where you use the red pepper things. Run up this wall and don't hit into something, you moron. The painting takes you back to Cascade and that is about it. Yeah, next kingdom. Hey Mario, did you know you can long jump? Yeah, if you just like jump but long, you're able to long jump. Isn't that really interesting? Isn't it really interesting how you can like long jump in this game? Isn't that cool? Yeah, if you just like press a button and like- Bublane, bubble lane, more like bublane, got him. Hey look, Nintendo, I get you want to be a pessimist here, but even an optimist would know that glass is a fair bit more than half empty. Before we tackle that situation, however, we must first make Mario shirtless, because you can't enjoy the game otherwise. Once more, we are forced against our will to grab four moons. However, unlike last time we got this, we can actually, you know, explore the kingdom and do things that don't relate to the story, such as catfishing, or grabbing one of the four specific moons. Damn it! The main two captures of this kingdom are the cheap cheeps and these water squid thing guys. You can jet forward as well as upwards, but only for a little bit unless you're touching water. We can use these squets to enter a new sub area, which entirely focuses on the movement abilities of the squirgies. My favorite part about said sub area is the fact that you can fail. Now, guess what type of moon is back? That's right, baby, the seed moon. It's back and better than ever. And by better than ever, I mean identical to the way it was in Sand Kingdom. Slow movement and all. The underwater segments of this kingdom are a lot better than the ones we had in Lake Kingdom. That could be because of the expanded area, could be because it just looks better or is better designed, but either way, it's still better. There's also quite a fair amount to do down here, such as collect moons, or collect moons, or collect moons, or talk to a sphinx, or collect moons. One really interesting thing about this kingdom that I believe is also unique to it is the fact that stores actually move about. Finally, I've always wanted capitalism on the go. Another interesting thing about this kingdom is how the seeds were placed in the most irritating locations possible. That isn't hyperbole either. Nintendo actually gathered the greatest minds from across the world to calculate the exact locations which are most likely to give you a stomach ulcer. I mean, why else would there be a seed placed from the furthest possible position from the pots? What other logical reason could there be? Remember how I was praising that one room in Snow Kingdom for not just being a stand here and do a silly dance moon? Well, you'll never guess what this is. Correct! It was in fact an allegory for how Mario likes to drink bleach. Back onto the topic of seed moons, there is one thing that this kingdom does right, and it's the fact that you don't have to wait for them to slowly grow like we did back in Sand Kingdom. No, you can just water them and then they grow. That doesn't redeem all the ulcers I have though. One thing that does redeem them, however, is the funny pirate outfit. All right, let's go do main story stuff now. Let's just get to the top of this lighthouse. How? You may ask why by jumping down a well, of course. So that's what Timmy was trying to do. If you thought that one was strange, just wait until you see this one where Mario removes lava just delicately sitting on top of water because of course that's how lava and water works, especially when you mix the two together. Actually, cleaning said lava is a very weird process, however, it's one that can be cheesed, so yippee. The last of the four main story moons that I ended up getting was definitely the one I was intended to get first, as unlike these other three where you have a small little challenge or you clean lava, I guess, I don't know, this one, you literally just go up, at the, you find it, well done, congratulations. We can now finally fight the funny boss, and honestly, they're really good. Unlike all the others, this dude's arena is the whole entire kingdom. Well, other than that one, the Lal Cove, but like, the main bits? Yeah, you get to fight him around there. Mix that with the need to have water preservation skills so you don't end up randomly running out of it right as you're about to hit them, so you just kind of awkwardly fall down. And you're in for quite a fun fight.
overall, that's it for this kingdom. Except for this. You have to hit the ball 100 times. Now, that wouldn't be too big an issue. Well, it still would be, you know, irritating. But what makes it worse is the fact that it is so damn slow for the first 50 times. And when you fail, which you will fail, even I did, and I'm definitely great and cool at video games, you have to restart the process all over again. And the more times you repeat it, the more irritating and the more noticeable the incredibly slow startup is. Seeing as I'm clearly far too underleveled to actually go and finish that stupid part, I might as well just leave the kingdom, which, by the way, is an overall pretty good one. Except for the tumor. Hey Mario, did you know- Engine. The Brutals are after some cooking. I mean, I don't blame them, I'm feeling a bit peckish myself. Said hunger has undeniably been enhanced by this kingdom's theme of food. When I say food, I don't mean your basic smelly, diabetic land. No, I mean vegetables and stuff. Look ma, I did a cool skip. I also accidentally captured an enemy I don't want to talk about yet. Look ma, I- <coughs> Never mind, don't look, don't look, don't look. Okay. Now I'll talk about the funny lab of bubble people. After catfishing, of course. These can move about in hot liquids, and that's it. I mean, it's cool to see them, but eh. Oh hey, it's this dude again. Yeah, despite how easy they are, I still manage to mess up. What is wrong with me? Oh wait, yeah, this is also capturable, technically. They work similarly to those poles in New Donk City that I forgot to mention earlier. Welcome to Peronza Plaza. Peronza. However you want to say it, I don't care. A place where you can knock down cans and gamble. Also some other stuff, but come on. Who cares? Gambling. Before continuing on with this kingdom, Mario needs to get into the Yoshi's Cookie reference outfit. Because... Reasons. Also to enter this sub-area, but mostly... Reasons. This kingdom changes up how the seed moons work. However, said change isn't as cool as what we saw in New Donk. It's literally just the exact same thing, except now the seeds are turnips. Which, I guess you can see as a reference to Mario 2, but eh, that's kind of pushing it. It'd be like going to a farm and going, <gasps> Mario Kart Wii reference? Oh boy, sub-area time. This one is really forking annoying. <laughs> On to the third capture, this one being the Pan Bro. Essentially, they are Hammer Bros but now they're Cosme and Paula. Their main purpose, much to Wallace's dismay, is to destroy cheese. A mechanic so cool and so innovative, they gave it its own sub-area. Also, can I just add, I like how this kingdom's goop doesn't kill you instantly, unlike what we saw in Funny Lost Kingdom. Speaking of killing things instantly, why can the pans just delete turnips from existence? Pans can't do that. I stand corrected. Alright, fourth capture of this kingdom time, and arguably, it's the best one in the entire game. You can finally fulfill that dream of yours of turning Mario into meat. Apparently, the game wanted us to do that, so yippee, I guess? Oh, good. It's erupting. Climb up the cascading magma, I don't see an issue with that at all. Sounds like a wonderful idea. But first, we need to discuss the painting, which honestly, I'm not a fan of as it spoils two really cool things. So cool, in fact, I'm not gonna show you. Uh, until later on in the video, obviously. Or maybe I won't, just to spite you. Well, no way, Super Pooper Mario reference? Wow, that was... Almost impressive. Almost. Oh, for- just go in! Thank you. Oh wait, I also forgot there's the fifth capture. Firana plants. They're- they're like the piranha plants, except instead of goop, it's- they have heartburn. Yeah. Wrong's at the top now, so- What? Did, did- did Mario just get burnt downwards? What? If not for the fact I was so confused, I'd be- Confused. Okay, good, he burnt himself upwards this time. Alright, boss time. This one sucks. Go bite in a circle for like five years until you give them indigestion. Then just jump up their vomit. I now know that said five years can be skipped by jumping into the stomach, but like, 
I didn't know that at the time. Alright? And that's what matters. It's the fact that I went through this boss twice, you'll see later on, and I had to do that five years. Do you know how many years that is? At least five. Swimming up the aforementioned stomach acid isn't fun at all, as the weird perspective and jumping mechanics of the lava bubbles just make it difficult to tell where you're actually going, especially when it starts splitting off the chunks. Alright, we may have contaminated the entirety of the food, but hey, we got the bugger. Er, birder. That's it for this kingdom. Or this one cool sub area in this funny outfit. Bowser's Kingdom. The perfect location for the final battle. Hey Mario! Wait, actually, that is a good question. Why are we sh- What the f- This kingdom looks awesome! The ruined architecture mixed with the focus on grey really assists in the whole melancholic vibe they've got going on. The dragon doesn't quite add to that vibe though. Yes, the big funny realistic dragon. The third of why in God's name is this realistic of this game. Now, due to said unfitting yet really cool looking design, you may expect this boss to be really good. And you'd be correct! Each of the three phases is split up into three parts. One, dodge the shock. Two, dodge the shock. Three, give the funny dragon a shock by giving him a concussion. And with that, the kingdom's done already. Yeah, it didn't even last a minute. That is honestly really depressing, because this is one of the coolest designed kingdoms of this game. I mean, you give Lake Kingdom, not, well, maybe not a full kingdom, but you give them a small kingdom, and yet this gets, well, you fight here, like, it's literally the same size as Cloud Kingdom, except even more depressing, because Cloud Kingdom was just a bunch of white everywhere. Hey, my- So here we are at Bowser's Kingdom. Wait, where, where's the lava and bricks and falling rocks and stuff? Nintendo's fooled us all. So yeah, as you can very obviously see, this kingdom decides to go for a much different look than what we usually expect from Bowser levels. Heck, I don't think there even is any lava here, both in the sub areas and in the actual place itself. To be honest with you, I'm not too big a fan of this kingdom. The fact that it's so linear with your progression is what really drags it down for me. Like, you're free to explore each section as much as you damn please, but the issue is that you have to go to each section in a specific order, and that really hurts the replayability of this place. Especially considering how, if you look in the top left corner, you'll notice how there isn't any moon symbols, or like, you know how before it would have been, oh, you need this many moons to progress, and if you got those moons, you could leave without doing the main story objectives? Yeah, well now, there is none of that. The only thing you do here is go do the main story thing, which means that no matter what, you're gonna have to go through each of the sections. I mean, like, either way, I was still gonna do the fight, because I'm trying to 100% the game here. Most others probably would have done it, if not for 100%, just because, you know, you're fighting Bowser. That's the whole thing Mario does. Still, it is an annoying thing. Another reason I dislike this kingdom is because of these annoying buggers. Er, birders. The Pokio's main gimmick is that it pokes, surprisingly, and can fling. My main gripe with these is the inconsistency of the way you control it. See, what, when it's in like the air and you press Y, then the funny beak extends out, and when you let go of Y, it goes back to its normal position. But whenever you go to a wall, it turns into a toggle, that's what the Y button does now, where it's extended, let go of the Y button, still extended, press it again, falls down. Or if you fling, then the beat gets disconnected, and then returns to its normal position. 
I just don't like this as I keep on getting confused and holding down the Y button while flinging, which has led to many, many, many mistakes, including deaths. I get a fair amount of them. Not really in this kingdom, but still, there is a fair few later on. Something I will definitely say is good about this kingdom is the design of the moons. They look very yummy and cherry flavored. Speaking of things that look yummy, I also like to look at the purple coins. Yes, coins are delicious. I eat them on a daily basis. Mm, yum, yum, yum. Hey, remember those exploding footballs or soccer balls if you're a freak against nature from 3D World? Yeah, well, they make return here. Albeit they're reskinned, but they serve the same purpose. They can destroy blocks that Mario can't normally. After playing with balls for a while, we move on to the most important part of any kingdom. And I don't just mean in the game, I mean in real life the gift shop. You can capture these dudes, which turn them from this whatever the hell that's supposed to be, into a funny cool Mario 3 reference. Speaking of funny, their name is incredibly very much that if you remove one of the vowels. Wait, how is it that the literal suit of armor costs less than the funny piece of licorice around the head and a t-shirt? That, that, that just seems a bit weird to me. Said armor gives us access to a 2D section, one which features these weird mushroom things that we've seen before in previous 2D Mario games. However, we haven't seen it before in this game, and I believe we don't see it again. So, well done, random sub-area locked behind a costume purchase. You win the award of having something unique to yourself, I guess? I mean, that and the fact it's on a folding screen thing, so. It has two things that makes it cool. Do you remember when we refought two of the funny rabbits, you know, one in the lunch, one in the snow? Yeah, well, that still leaves two of them to be fought it again. And here they are, baby! I'm gonna be completely honest with you, I don't like the fact that they're both here at the same time. It honestly just feels like they went, oh, yeah, let, let's put the rabbits in. Oh, we had, no, we, for, we forgot, no, no, we only have this kingdom where you can fight the last two, so let's just put them at the same time. Now, fighting against Topper is a really fun thing to redo, because this is the first time you've done it since the very start of the game, and it works as a real good way to show the player's development throughout the game, of their skills, of their ability, of what have you. Now, all it does for me is show my D development re-development. Development but backwards, as instead of getting hit once like I did in that fight, I get hit twice. There is something seriously wrong with my brain, and I'm gonna figure it out one day. Oh yeah, this fight is the same. And with that, we have murdered all four of the Brutals. I mean, we also murdered their mother earlier, but we all forgot about that, let's be honest. So we've murdered all the Brutals. And so Mario's journey up the keep begins, or continues. I mean, we've been making our way towards it this entire time, but now we're going distinctly up the ways, so. Before we actually go to the keep itself, though, we need to go to the sub-area, which, trust me, you'll be seeing an amount of. The trick for this one is to completely get rid of everything on your controller, bar the Y button and the B button. Alright, all you need Mario to do here is jump, and make sure you throw his caps so that he picks up the funny flowers. Oh, but what about the other moon? Just grind pound, walk over to it with your controller, which no longer has sticks anyway, so good luck with that. Then pick up the flowers and keep going. Or just jump off since you're no longer going to be able to get every single coin anymore. Alright, it's finally time to kick Bowser's teeth in. Again. Yeah, sure, pal. And I befriended your mother last night. Ow! Oh. I guess neither of us were lying. Okay, okay, this is fine. I can catch up him really quickly, just gotta hop back to the Odyssey. Should be not too long a journey. Never mind, I guess first we have to fight the restless spirits of the many people we have killed along the journey. And by many, I mean four of them. This is honestly a pretty enjoyable fight. I like the whole gimmick of having to climb up the thing and attack the brutal inside. I also like the way that you have to kind of attack their legs and hit back the attacks that they fling at you. It's a nice fight, and after three hits, it's finished. Or not? Oh my god. That's why Topper only took two hits earlier. It's because he is saving his third one for this fight! I mean, it still doesn't make them any more difficult, it just takes a little bit longer, but yeah, there you go. We've killed them again, for realsies hopefully this time. And with that, we can actually go chase after Bowser again. It's the thing we've been doing this entire game, but now we definitely know where he's going, for real. Hmm. 
Now, look, I could bore you and explain what I did in Bowser's Kingdom after the fight. You know, making very comedic remarks about this moon or that sub area or what purple coins I found, but let's be honest, nobody cares about that. Bowser just went to the bloody moon. A thing which somehow shocks people, despite the fact that he was literally generating galaxies in a previous game. Also, there wasn't really anything of note that occurred afterwards, so... But mostly it's because I just want to talk about going to the moon already. But first, seeing as this video is 2 hours, 40 minutes, and 10 seconds long, I'd say it's finally time we make Luigi canon. Chucking in the moons we collect in this kingdom finally completes the Odyssey giving it a hot air balloon-esque design, as well as a nice coat of paint on the sail thing, which is not a balloon, I guess. I don't know, it's weird how this thing functions. Now, one would think this is a vessel not fit for space travel, however, Bowser's ship wouldn't be able to function even in the planet's atmosphere. Like, it would work in the water, but it wouldn't exactly be able to fly, so just kind of push those thoughts out of your mind as this game is supposed to be taken seriously. Or maybe it is, I don't know. Okay, I guess the game doesn't want it to be Luigi time. I'll save that for a different day then. Right, here we go. Do you have anything to add, Cappy? Are you sure you don't want to teach me how to jump? Okay, good, let's talk about the moon. The moon. You have to admit, Bowser picked a damn good venue. It's remote, it's scenic, it's the moon. Honestly, he couldn't have done better. Speaking of the moon, as you can expect, the gravity here is different to what it is back on the Mario planet or Earth or whatever we're calling it, so Mario's jump is a lot higher than normal. Despite the amount of things this kingdom holds for me till you've actually, you know, beaten the game and saved Peach, like what the whole point of this journey is, there still is a surprising amount to do here such as this funny timer challenge. It's a really simple one, but it makes quite a good use of the new jump mechanics, so I'd say it's quite good. Now, as you might have noticed, the funny place where the wedding is actually happening is all the way up there, and good old Marcus is all the way down here. So, we're gonna have to find a pathway up, such as this scary cave. Now, this is a final level. It's got lava, it's got great music, it's got a bunch of captures we've seen throughout the game, some reskinned, some not reskinned, despite the fact that I feel one of them really needed to be reskinned, but I have no idea what it could have been changed to, so. The hidden moons here are also quite enjoyable as well. For example, this one where you take a Banzai build back way to the beginning area to pick up one. I definitely didn't fail on this moon the first time, no. After a Moai section, which reminds a player of how terrible and lame some of the captures in this game are, we get to become a charge and chuck. Their name don't lie. They do charge. Okay, well, half their name lies as they don't chuck, but hey, they're still a really fun thing to control. We end this really enjoyable sub area with a fight against your mother once more. A decent fight, but since we never see this character again for the rest of the game, I'm just gonna have to assume we canonically kill them here. That's it. That is Madame Brood dead, very much. I was joking about the Brutals earlier, but no, she's just gone. All right. After escaping the cave, it's finally time to end this. Wait, 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 hold on. How did it, any of you people get here? There, there wasn't like cars outside or vehicles or like any way for you to get up here. Like, were you flying in Bowser's airship to get up here? Confusing as all hell as that may be, who cares? It's time we actually stand up to Bowser, and or, or we don't. Now the real question is, was this place built with that mind or did Bowser add that? Because both of those seem very, very improbable. There we go. This is the proper arena for it. And with a line that goes as hard as that, I definitely say we've reached the actual final boss fight this time. This fight sadly isn't unique, it is just a much stronger version of the fight that we saw earlier in Cloud Kingdom, except now the music's better, the arena doesn't suck, and Bowser's suit explodes. With the true villain being Bowser's suit finally defeated, and Peach being saved, I'd say that's the game done. If not for the fact that we hit Bowser into a load-bearing pillar, so now the entire moon is collapsing.
What are we gonna do? I have an idea. That's right. We get to control the big man himself. I really like how we get a callback to that scene from the beginning of the game where we go through the frog's memories except now we're going through Bowser's memories. Sure, it doesn't show like every single Mario game ever made, but it still is a really cool callback to have. Bowser has six health, despite the fact that every single fight against him usually takes three hits, but anyway, can shoot fire if you hold down the Y button, and use his funny claws, because why else would he have them? I absolutely love how this section is. From the actual colors, to the bits from the ceiling falling into the lava below, to even the music in the background and the actual design from a gameplay standpoint, it just makes this a ridiculously memorable and ridiculously enjoyable part of the game. They even managed to fit in a 2D section, which is always a nice thing to see, because there's a shockingly low amount of them in this game. That does make sense though when you consider how little mobility Mario has in those segments. And that is only the first bit of this segment, alright? That's not even including the second bit. Smashing through this wall reveals our exit, but to get there we must destroy four more pillars, and so we do so. Powered on by an amazing song in the background, which even steals a bit from Bowser's Mario 64 theme. Once more, Nintendo really knocked out of the park with the actual design of this location. I mean, the big kind of window which reveals the earth to you, and the golden design of the area. It's just well done. For how, let's be honest, weak the Switch is, they did a damn good job at making this place look nice. Destroying the pillars not only expedites the moon's collapse, but also reveals a spark pile onto us once we've destroyed all four. We can use it to get the hell out of here. We even managed to take Bowser with us some high. I, I didn't know he could capture one thing and then capture another thing. Hey, maybe that'll be explored in the sequel that's definitely gonna happen, right? And with that, the hats are reunited, Peach is saved, and Mario is given the golden opportunity to propose. Which he then fumbles. Mario, not even five minutes ago, you saw Peach acting very uncomfortable at the idea of Bowser marrying her, okay? I'm not sure why you deemed it necessary to quickly shove a flower in her face go, No! Pick me! Pick- She was obviously gonna pick you, man. I'm gonna be honest with you here, you deserve to be left stranded on the moon. Except not really, as this is a Nintendo and also a kids game. Of course, not gonna leave the main character to slowly starve to death on the moon. Which means that we finally get to kick Bowser's teeth in, like I said we would multiple times. And with that, we're finally done the game. Except not really. Not only did we miss a bunch of moons along the way, but a whole lot more of them show up in the post-game thanks to these bloody things. Also, more costumes become available, and three new kingdoms open up. Well, 1.5 kingdoms plus a glorified sub-area, but still, that's three new things on top of all of that. This means that this already way too long video isn't over yet. No, we still have all that to cover. So I recommend getting a second bowl of popcorn or another tub of ice cream or something, because you're going to be here for another while. Phew. All right, there's a lot to talk about here. Okay, it's more like two things, but that's still two more than Lake Kingdom. Firstly, Luigi is here. Told you he'd be real. He and his side mode was added via a update a good while after the game release, so I'll be saving him for later. The other thing is Peach's Castle, which Luncheon's painting spoiled. Disgusting. Speaking of paintings, the painting here takes you to Snow Kingdom, so that's something. Make sure to keep that in mind. A couple new types of moons are introduced. The first we see being the music moon thing. Basically this one guy's like, hey, can you name me a song that evokes this feel? And then you open your map, go to the music, and play said song. Oh, by the way, you can open the map, go to your music, and play songs now. So, that's something. Anyway, guess what kind of moon is back? That's right, the funny bunny catching ones I haven't mentioned up to this point. The other cool thing Luncheon spoiled was this. That's right, after years upon years of giving us constant references to the original Super Mario Bros, 
Nintendo are finally shoving in some references to 64, which we've already seen before, so I don't know why I'm treating this like such a big deal, but also, it is a big deal. Because, I mean, just look at that. I mean, sure, it's not a Mario and Luigi reference like we so desperately need, but hey, it's still something. It's not just the moons that are referenced to Mario 64 here. Removing the things in the grind drains the water from around Peach's castle even playing the same sound it did when he did so in 64. 3D Land also gets a small reference in that one tree that's at the start of the game being there. So, that's cool I guess. Another thing that makes a comeback is the sheep herding moon from earlier. It uh, oh god what's the word, sucks a lot? You have to find six of them. Three was bad enough, but six? That's thrice as bad. There's also this difficult 2D section. Okay, it's not that hard, but I swear, this one moon was more difficult than, like, most of the bosses in this game. And, you'll never guess who's on top of the castle. Me. I am. Also Yoshi, which references Super Mario 64, but honestly, who cares? As Yoshi, you can eat it a fruit until his stomach is full, and then you get a moon. His stomach empties every time after you get said moon, so the only logical explanation for that is that the moons are defecated out of him. So that's cool. You can do this three times, but hey, if you feel sad about the fact that you get to do it three times, don't worry, because there's a fourth one you can do in a sub area. See? Now you're happy again. There's also a fifth later on, I believe. All right, all right. Let's actually go into Peach's Castle. As you can see, it is loosely based off the of 64s. You know, you've got the funny star sun thing on the floor, uh, the same vague shape and that's about it. This area is where you find the recently widowed Toadette. She works as a sort of achievement system for this game. From moon finding to jumping to world peace. You know, the top three most commonly seen achievements. Now, this would be fine. Heck, it would be a really fun concept. If not for the fact that each of these give you a moon. Now, once again, this wouldn't be too big an issue. But it's the fact that you have to collect each moon individually, one by one, 60 bloody moons, and they play the same sound every single time. Look, I love the funny Mario 64 star get sound, right? But hearing it back to back that many times really drains a person, you know? Also, it's not just automatic. No, it isn't you go up to Toadette, press A once, and then sit through all the animations. No, 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 no. You have to actively press the A button to interact with her each time for each individual moon. And you can't just spam A either, no. It takes like half a second for the prompt to come up. Meaning, you might end up accidentally jumping if you spam A, which makes it take even longer to get the moon. I don't even have all of the things done to get every single one of these moons, okay? And yet it's still took ages. I only got roughly half of them. There is still another 30 of that to sit through before this is done. But we're saving that for later. Besides, we've got face building to do, which also sucks. Okay, it doesn't quite suck, but I really, really hate how they handled the eyes here. See, there's a very, very small difference between them to tell the difference from the left eye and the right eye. And because of the fact that they put the right eye on the left side and the left eye on the right side, one is very likely to confuse the hell out of which side they're supposed to go on. Meaning even though this face here should have been enough for the moon, it's somehow only worth 68%. It really should have been 69 because at least that's a funny number, but no, 68, despite the fact that everything's in roughly the right place, but oh, the eyes should have been the other way round. It took me an embarrassing amount of tries to figure that out. And by embarrassing, I mean three. But that's still three too many, you know? After finishing that crap, all 100 purple coins, or poings if you feel so inclined, get collected. Which means we can go buy this kingdom's garbage. But first, I think we should look at the coin store, because holy shrimp! That altogether costs more than 80,000 coins! Look, I know a majority of those were added in like post-game updates, but 80,000? And the funny thing is, that's not even all of them, though a bunch of them are locked behind certain moon amounts. So there's even more money you'll need to get. Also, yes, that outfit is a reference to the Satellaview, the Google Stadia of the Super Nintendo. So 
Well done if you spotted that. But who cares about a reference to a really small thing the majority of the Nintendo community don't know about? You can lose polygons! Jokes aside, I really, really like this outfit, even if it got spoiled for me online. Thanks, Proficia Gaming. What's even funnier about said costume is that that's not even the last reference to Mario 64 here. No, there's also paintings. Sadly, not a bob on Battlefield or Jolly Roger Bay, but hey, they take you to refight the bosses, but now they're more difficult, so that's something. The bird adds these things. Meckler performs mitosis. Facey McFist face has these really annoying mummies. And we're gonna take a wee break. Inside this costume locked room here is a proper nice callback to 64. Something we've seen a lot of so far. But what they've done is they've gotten the courtyard from that game. I just plopped it in. 2D trees, same old geometry, same textures, but hey, now there's one of those annoying find the correct order chest things, which was also introduced in 64, so that's something. Glad to see after 19 odd years of evolution of Mario, they finally find a way to make said type of star more annoying by adding mummies. Back to the bosses, Pikmin 4 adds the fire ring boyo things, Dark Souls 2 is slippery, and last but most certainly least, the squid blows now. Remember why I liked the fight before? Both because of the need to preserve your water and the fact they need to fight him around the whole kingdom. Yeah, do you notice how neither of those are here? Look, I can understand them not giving you the entirety of Bub Lane, but you could have at least kept the water. That's a bit that was enjoyable. Now having it rain, meaning that you have a constant water supply, means you just hold the Y button, dodge a couple attacks, I guess. When you get close to him, bam, you're done. And that's just irritating to me, man, because it's way easier. All right, and guess what? There's another Mario 64 reference kinda here, as well as in every other kingdom, well, most other kingdoms. See, now you get to race against a group of Koopas. You get to do this twice in each kingdom. Well, technically you get to do it as many times as you want, but you don't get any reward after the second time. So you get to do this twice in each kingdom, once with really easy opponents, and once with three really easy opponents, plus an actually difficult one. I mean, I say actually difficult, I still manage to do most of these first try, but still, relatively difficult. These are quite fun, all right? After this sick trick shot, I do say it's finally time to deposit the 92 moons we have accumulated so far. Psych! Remember those paintings I said to remember? Using them, we can go to other kingdoms without ever touching the Odyssey. Why not just use the Odyssey, you may be thinking. Well, you moron, as demonstrated, like, three times in this video, to go to a different kingdom, you must throw Cappy onto the globe. But whenever you do that, he deposits all of your moons. So, if we use the paintings, we can get around this and get to other kingdoms without having to touch it, and therefore build up a giant collection of moons that we'll eventually have to deposit anyway. Now you may ask, why would you do this? What do you gain from this? And my answer to this is this. And so, GN went off on this quest to get at least four moons at once. However, due to how bloody long this video is, good god, only the moons that cause the most pain to his buttocks will be discussed. Beginning with Snow Kingdom, which is honestly a pretty lame one to begin with, but hey, it's better than luncheon maybe? In the sense of it being better to start on, I don't mean like in general. Hey, remember that funny stone from earlier? It's back, baby, and now it's some actual use. Hitting these creates a host of new moons to collect, some with the new sub areas, some just dotted about the place, and some a slightly more unforgiving version of an earlier minigame. Also, the Koopa Racers show up again. This one is fine enough, the lack of visibility makes for an interesting challenge, I guess. Oh, I forgot to mention this earlier, but Peach is missing! Oh, wait, never mind. Okay, with all that out of the way, let's talk about the annoying mo- What do you mean there isn't any? Yeah, other than Bind Bull being a bit annoying, there's nothing truly of note here. This is the next kingdom or something. Oh, Cascade. Christ, it's been a minute. One thing I forgot to mention earlier was how a store was set up here the second you leave the kingdom, giving use to the funny purple circles. Purples, if you will. No, purkles? No. Honestly, I'm not a fan of Funny Cave Manio, the hair just shouldn't exist, but it's still cool enough. The Taurus, Turtles, the Princess, and the Moon Rock is also here. Other than the first thing, you'll be seeing these in practically every single kingdom. Once again, there's no real annoying moons here, which I mean, hey, 
Well done, Nintendo. You know, you've done your job and you've gotten two kingdoms down, well, revisit-wise, without a single annoying moon. So this is great for them. Not great for me, though. I need content. Wait, is this the first time you use this painting-shaped canvas? Cool. Ladies and cements, I give you the first annoying moon in these revisits. I hate the Pokio. This entire sub-area is built around them. No wonder I hated it. It's challenging in a fun way, I guess, but due to my personal hatred towards these annoying little bird things, I just cannot play this one. I mean, I can, and did, and got both the moons, but I don't want to. Now that I think about it, this sub-area is also bad. Not nearly on the same level as the Pokio one, but still is quite irritating thanks to the immeasurably slow speed of the fly bones. Another annoying moon, but this time one that isn't in a sub-area, is this one. Fall down and poke the beak nose into the hole. It's like study fall, but bad. You know, I'll give them points on creativity though, it's a decent place to hide a moon. Another annoying one, Christ, you'd almost think I dislike this kingdom or something. Jump off these constantly moving poles to grab a key, then go all the way back to the start to grab a moon, because it wasn't tedious enough. Yippee. This one is bad because it forces you to use motion controls. Okay, this being a bit harsh as it is, decently well designed, but Christ, Nintendo, did you really need to make the cappy spin such a pain to perform without swinging your controller by, like, the average person in an early Wii commercial? Okay, let's end this on a positive, uh, the Koopa race is cool, I guess. I like jumping down from way up here. This revisit was a bit of a bust. Let's hope the next one is more like the previous two. But at the same time, more annoying moons means more content, so... First time using this one too. Cool. You. I. Despise. You. How dare you even come into my set? Now usually I'd interrupt this exaggerated anger with a clip of me completing said difficult task, unenthusiastically saying, I did it. However, I did not do it. In fact, I didn't do it in the worst way possible by almost doing this. This further cements how horrible this part is and how the person who pitches should be shot from a cannon and f- Haha, <laughs> got you again. This time I got 37 and then failed and left to go do some other things. Like this thing. And I guess this? The, the maze is kind of hard. Yeah, other than he who can be named, but I personally will refrain from it, and the water, I guess, there's nothing overly atrocious here, which only places more focus on the accursed game. Late King- <laughs> This frog bit is annoying due to the wacky jump and slow walk speed, I guess. I feel like I should be more angry towards this bit due to the fact I wasted eight and a half minutes on it, but it's probably just a skill issue, not gonna lie. A little side note here, but I'm really surprised that this outfit counts as space themed. I mean, it undoubtedly is. But since it was added via post-game updates, I would've expected them not to have bothered allowing this one for the moon. Nice touch, Nintendo. Well done. Gold, gold star, one point for you. Oh, wait, right, I'm supposed to be complaining. Uh, this look up in the sky moon sucks. I don't see how it's fair to hide something up there with no indication it exists, bar a hint from that stupid bird. Woo, seed moons, yeah. I love having to slowly swim through water, baby. Woo! Peach is here and Mario almost drowns. Next. Desert. 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 This bit is fun, but a tad unfitting based off the fact that the squid men live in water places and deserts characteristically lack that. I quite like the sub-area here as it reminds me a lot of the red pepper Yoshi levels from Galaxy 2. Okay, now here's something to complain about. This moon blows. You have to be ridiculous. Ridiculously precise with the movements. Very smelly. Zero out of ten. There's this Moai bit, which legitimately is the only moon they made for this capture that doesn't blow. And yeah, that's about it really. Bar this one bit where I missed a goal like a moron. Next kingdom. New Donk. Donk, if you will. Gotta love the moon rock. Or rune, if you may. Being right next to Mario's ship, or this bit is unfunny if you feel so inclined. Though it's been in other kingdoms, now is a very good time to bring up the dog moons. They suck a very much. The dogs randomly follow you about and, if it's a bank holiday or the second Tuesday of March, digs the moon out. I hate him. One thing I don't hate, however, is the RC race. That's a lie, it also isn't fun. It it's not bad, but man, did they really need to make the car this weird to control? Like, I get it's realistic to high RC cars in real life control, but constipation is in real life too, but you don't see Mario sitting on a toilet for four hours to feed it, do you? Oh hey, some letters that spell out Moreo. 
I sure believe these won't be a vital part of Mario's villain arc later. This motorcycle bit is at the fun. Sure, the thing is clunky to control, but I don't know, man, this moon feels real goods. Same with the secret room. Anyway, have you ever played 1-1? One -one? Well, now's your chance, baby. I love 1-1. One -one. Woo! Sure, it's a nice sweet callback, but I think the words just outside the door say it best. This one's cool, as to get it, all you have to do is show this man a picture of you. However, because this clip was recorded, like, 30 years ago, I had to make a suitable substitute. This sub-area is fun enough, but I just don't understand why it's in this kingdom. These guys are from Bowser's kingdom. Why, why is a sub-area here and not there? Pauline wants a gift, which we're apparently obligated to get her now. Said gifts you can find lying about the place, which probably don't make for that good gifts, and I think about it, all references to those items in Donkey Kong. You know, the, the original one, not the country. They work similarly to seeds, though, so ew, icky, gross. This sub area is somewhat annoying because of the smelly hammer bros movement. It's well designed and all, but Jesus, would it kill to pick up the pace? Yes! Okay. New donk. More like new dunk. For now, wood time. It's quite foreboding when the first moon of the kingdom is a bad one, isn't it? Sonic fans will get a good kick out of it though. Another music toad. These are still kinda lame. If they played a song for you and you had to try and guess its name, or if there was multiple you had to get right in a row, I'd find it a lot better. But no, it's find one song. Yippee. After a couple of alright moons, you reach another garbage one. Good teeth, this one is awful. What I thought is a good idea to add these sheep moons to the game should be hunted down by PETA from putting the idea in my head that I should go and kill every single sheep out there because this is so irritating. Also, sorry, Wales. I really like this next one, though. I love slowly moving a stupid bloody tank down to a single block it needs to break. They really captured what it's like to be in a war, and by being in a war, I mean slowly starved to death on a deserted island. This one bugs me as well. I kinda like the idea, but the poison is so bloody irritating, man. Is it truly necessary to stop all momentum and make Mario sit down and think about it since every single time one atom of the man touches the stuff? And this moon! The death here was entirely my fault. I'm still gonna be angry at the devs for it, though. Why not just let Mario fly with no consequences? Koopa race, painting, next. Engine. I tell you, if you counted up each time I died because I thunked you could throw your hat after uncapturing an enemy, you'd see a number so large it almost describes my painfully long pain drive. My pen drive. It's where I stored all the video footage in for a while. You thought I was gonna say Peter, weren't you? Yeah, as you can tell from the fact I'm scraping the absolute bottom of the barrel for jokes, there's pretty much nothing to talk about here. I mean, sure, you've got this bit where if you make a single mistake, you're completely dead, but other than that, this kingdom's fine enough. On to the next one. So here we are again. Nothing new has cropped up here, so I'll primarily be getting moons from Toadette. Remember how fun that was? This clip is a whole four minutes long. Not all of that is spent grabbing these things, but a good chunk of it is. And that lunkies and worm singular is all the moons I can be bothered to grab this way. All that is left now is to play you the music of the gods. I give you 29 seconds of depositing moons. Three hundred and thirteen bloody moons without even touching the Odyssey once. But we're not done yet! That's right folks, there's somehow still more to talk about. We are still missing a hundred and eighty-three moons to complete the game. Twenty-seven of which are in areas we are yet to explore. Before getting to those however, I feel it's probably a good idea to go clean up the rest of the moons that are in areas that we have been to, so Let's go do that. Mm -hmm. 
due to budgetary constraints, the rest of this epic montage sadly cannot be created. So instead, I shall read out what would have happened if we were able to continue it. A moon is collected. A moon is collected. A moon is collected. Jesus shows up. He gives Mario a moon and they go get ice cream. A moon is collected. Yeah, honestly, there's not really much else to talk about when it comes to the moons. See, the way that I play Mario Odyssey, thanks to the amount of times I've gone through the game, is that I like to get all of the annoying moons out of the way first, which means that on any form of revisits, there isn't exactly going to be as many of them for me to tackle. And that includes this, where for some kingdoms, this is the third time I've gone back to it. But, there was two that I left. You know exactly which two I'm talking about. The two malignant tumors in an alright collection of moons. Hero of the Beach and Jump Rope Genius. Though it may be tedious as hell, Hero of the Beach isn't actually that difficult. Just really unforgiving and poorly made. I will give them this though. It is still an amazing feeling to actually reach that number and get that moon and then never have to play that godforsaken mini game ever again till like a year and a half before I decide to replay Mario Odyssey. I can't say there's anything redeeming about the skipping rope genius moon, however. This one just sucks, alright? Say what you want about the stupid volleyball one, at least you don't need to try and be frame perfect to beat it. Seriously, I tried for ages to get the jumps right, but it just seems impossible. It probably is possible, but I don't care. Man, if only there was some nearby capture or something that could assist me in trying to acquire the moon. Oh, don't give me that look. One peek at the leaderboard shows literally everybody cheats on this moon. And I got all 879 other moons fully legitimately, alright? Just give me this one. Okay, and that's enough, me thinks. Perfect. That leaves us now with 27 more moons to get, the majority of which are in the next kingdom. Darkseid is a post-game kingdom comprised of two main bits, the first wish being a boss rush. You didn't think we were actually done with the Brutals, did you? Sure, their mother is very much dead, but they're still here. Some high would have thought being shot into space and exploding would have killed them, but guess not. They're the same as always. I don't know, maybe the first one's hat stack is taller or something, but I couldn't really see any main differences other than the lower gravity, which I guess can throw people off, but that made it so I didn't get hit by the first guy. So, woo, well done, I finally advanced my character. I also didn't get hit by the second and third one, so I guess that's pretty cool too. Did get hit by the fourth one, and then almost died to the big scary robot thing. The second main bit of the kingdom, as well as the most time consuming, is the hint art moons. These are moons where you are given either a screenshot or an artist rendition of an area in a different kingdom, and you need to go to that place and grind pound. These can range from, ooh, oh, oh yeah, yeah, no, I get it now, to, ugh. You know, it's, they can be done well, they can be done poorly. The ones here are just a mix of both. There's also some sub areas here, but who really cares? We are only one moon away now. Technically three moons, but the last moon is a multi-moon, so shut it from completing the game. So let's go actually talk about that. Phew. Since the dawn of Galaxy, it has been a tradition in 3D Mario games to reward the player with one last level for collecting everything in the game. In Galaxy 1, this was a simple and nice purple coin level set in the Mushroom Kingdom, featuring all the people you met along the way. In Galaxy 2 and every game since, the level is a gauntlet featuring and testing the player on practically every mechanic seen throughout the game. Mario Odyssey's secret last level is one of those ones, too. This one being so difficult, in fact, it took me about 4 hours to beat it. Yep, I wish I was joking. I also wish I was joking about 40 minutes of said recording being cut out. See, the issue with having such an old capture card that's just kind of, well, dangling, is that you might experience some issues sometimes, and sadly, that involves eating up the entirety of the run before the victory one, and the first half of the one where I actually managed to beat the thing. So how's the level itself? Well, it starts off with you landing the Odyssey and seeing a bunch of people there to greet you and cheer you on as you go into the pipe to do the hard level, I guess. How did they get up here? Like. It is a small little collection of platforms in the middle of a giant pit. I, I don't see how any of them got here. And you know what? It's great for Pauline to be here, you know, doing a performance of Jump Up Superstar. But 
you're a mayor and presumably a celebrity, I, I don't think this is a great venue. I mean, there's a shocking amount of people here, so maybe she knows something I don't. With that out of the way, let's talk about the actual level itself. Part 1. Optional Intruder Fight. It is not worth it. That This level has a lot of hidden health pickups along the way, so you aren't really going to need to have 6 health on you at any point. So if you're going to be going through this again and again and again, I don't think you should waste 5 odd minutes to beat the boss. Part 2. Falling Poles. It's easy enough, never really had any difficulty with it. I liked both of the main bits, where one is the solely falling down and the other is one that shoots down, shoots up. I don't know the names of these things. I probably should. Part 3. Running Hills. Because they're running. They didn't give me the runs. This bit is once again quite easy. Part part 4. Lava Bubble Bit. It's, it's boring. Like, it's not hard, it's not easy, and it's just fine. It's what you'd expect to see here. Next, part five, stretchy legs. Th it is stretchy. It does function. This bit's even worse than lava bubble bit, because it's just, don't touch the weird ground growing guys, the little fungus. Part six, it's very cool, ha 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 ha. Yeah, no, it's fine. I do like how if you time it just right, you can just completely glide over all of them and not take any damage from freezing or have to wait at all, so... The pr uh, it's very rare for that to happen, though. Well, not that rare, but it's an awkward thing to time right. Part 7, Yosho! Literally press one button at the right time. It is a quick time event, but slow and painful. So essentially, most quick time events, now that I think about it. Part 8, Bridgy Fireboyos thing. The only thing of note here is the fact you can cheat with it as uh, Yoshi, because you don't have to remove the capture, so you can just keep using them. Maybe it's intentional, but I, I don't think it is. I think it's just one of those things that works well if you keep the capture and still functions if you don't. Part 9, Optional Sphinx. A good break from the Sphinx to tightening level. I'm really trying here. Part 10, Up and at them. Who is them? Where is up? It's a good question. Uh, this part can also be cheesed. Part 11. Glider. I hardly knew her. Ah ha ha. This bit's great because you can use it to skip over the fork section. Part 13. Platform of Doom. The challenge is supposed to be not hitting the fireboys, but they make it a lot easier if you actually do so. Like, I don't get how you're supposed to beat this without hitting them. Sure, you can make the little whatever the hell those guys are supposed to be go away by throwing a hand at them, but it's nowhere near as good as using... I should- I really should have learned the name of the funny fireboyos, but it just became a recurring joke that I liked. Part 14! The! This bit is why I failed so damn much, okay? I hate the Pokios. Very, very much. It is the worst part of the game in my eyes. And there's a lot of parts of this game which people don't like or can be seen as bad. Probably. It's just, I can't control these things. And when you make something that I'm incapable of controlling, because obviously Nintendo are like, let's make it so the awesome GN can't play. But yes, when you mix that together with having to time things, it's it's just not great. I know, you know what makes this part even funnier? Remember earlier when I said that on my final run, about half of it was cut out due to good old capture card McGee screwing up over there? Yeah, it involved me actually beating this. Ain't, ain't that just delightful? Okay, it was actually the part after this where I then realized that, oh, it's not working properly and fixed it. Still, it cut out this bit, and the bit after this is way easier, so it wouldn't have been that impressive to show it off. But yeah. Part 15, 2D. I didn't get this bit either. As I said, I only checked the recording after this bit and rectified it so I could record the ending. There you go. Part 16, Bowsard. It's him. Look, when I said that they would test you on every mechanic so far, I meant it. Even the ones you just learnt. I say just learnt is good. 20 minutes ago at this point. It's fun enough. Part 17, thank you. The thank you message. A classic of games. This alongside the and you in the credits of some of them is, well, yeah, I like it. I really enjoy it. it makes the game feel a bit more personal. It makes it feel a bit more like art. Uh, the person with no talent is saying this. I especially like it when it's in one of those 100% levels, because 
to get the 100% level, you kind of have to do literally everything in the game. So that thank you is like, oh yeah, thank you for playing every part of the game instead of just giving us money. Part 18. The end. It's the end. Copy gives a little speech and, well, for the final time of the game, we get to hear the multi-moon jingle. But I'm not done yet! That's it, Nye, right? The sale has gone golden. What else could there possibly be? Well, we are still 119 moons short from hitting the max. But how? You may be asking in that exact tone of voice. Yeah, I know what you sound like. You've collected every moon! Yes. However, you can still buy moons. They are not cheap, however. 100 coins a pop for 119 moons is a fairly big number. A number which requires you to max out the coin height, go buy the moons, then collect another 1,901 coins. But how, you may be asking, again, where are you going to get that kind of cash? Well, there's two main options for that. Repeat the same bloody sub-area billions of times. Or... Played a new fun side mode added by updates. I went with sub area one first, and that was the worst mistake I have ever made in my whole career of being alive, okay? Please, for the sake of your own sanity, do the Luigi one. As I said though, the Luigi one was added after the game released, meaning to collect these 119 moons, you had to do the first way first. And it sucks, all right? Basically, you press the Y and B button at the right time, and you don't touch the stick at all, because if you touch the stick, you're not going to get some of the coins. Sure, you can try and go for the moon each time, but more than likely you're just going to end up falling off the track or being so not in position that you end up missing the rest of the coins. As I said, you have to do this over and over and over again. I think you get, what, 180 coins each time? I'm not 100% sure. It's been, as you saw, like, way earlier in the video. There's been a huge gap between me recording this audio and me actually doing the thing, so I don't have the numbers in my head anymore. But I know that it isn't exactly big, and that there is a lot of times you have to go through it. Okay, let's talk about Luigi now. I, I, I'm so excited for this. I love Luigi. Luigi's Balloon World is honestly an incredible side mode. It is comprised of two main elements, like a lot of things in this video. Firstly, hiding the balloons. You find the best spot for your balloon. Pretty simple. Uh, you start off from the same area each time. You can do this in multiple kingdoms by the by. Kind of important detail to mention. Collecting coins will up the amount of time you have to go and hide your balloon. And yeah, I think the rules are you can't have it be in the air. So if you end up jumping off at the last second, then the balloon will be placed in the last place, which was on the grind. If it's touching a slope, which is barely a slope, like it's practically a wall, then that still counts, as long as Mario can stand or slip on it. Secondly, finding the balloons. Thanks to the wonders of the internet, you can find balloons from other players throughout the world. Every time you look for a moon, you lose money, but if you pop it, then you gain a fair bit more than the entry fee. Said money you spend gets sent to the balloon owners, meaning that if you hide a balloon well enough, you can get an infinite stream of coins coming from just sitting on your hole. In fact, I'm pretty sure that the more people fail to find your balloon, the more money it costs to look for it, and therefore, the more money you get from it. With this video coming out near enough to the 5th year anniversary, which, Christ, I have really taken long on this thing, it just goes to show how old this game is, you know, 5 years, these servers have been up for pretty long as well, not quite five years, but still a while, and yet there's still a surprising amount of moons. Even more surprising than that is that these moons aren't just garbage ones and cheater ones. There are some actual people still playing the game and actual people still hiding the balloons. 
Undoubtedly, they're trying to get Luigi to all golden balloons, which is 100%ing the Luigi's Balloon World thing, essentially. Look, I've 100%ed everything else in this game. I'm not doing the Luigi one. I am not finding 800 moons in a row, okay? I have 100, I've found everything else, I've done all the other tasks there. I'm not doing the one where I have to play the game for another 50 hours. As much as I enjoy it, okay? As much as I love how you have to try and master Mario's movement to try and hide your balloon as fast as possible or go find somebody else's, I ain't playing it for like 50 hours. No matter which of those two things you pick, you're gonna get those 119 moons. Or you won't, because it's stupid. But if you're stupid, well done. You got them. Now we're done, right? You know, we, we got the top hat on Peach's castle, we got the little victory, you know, da -da 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 -da. we got that. We're done, right? Costumes! Not only is there a bunch of costumes that comes available after beating Bowser and reaching certain moon totals, but there's also all of the DLC ones that were added. You know, like the delightful Mario Cap one that makes him an 8-bit Mario that doesn't move that costs 9999 coins, or all those other ridiculously expensive ones. Yeah, no, the best way to go for these is also Luigi's Balloon Adventure. That still was a bit annoying though with how expensive some of them are, but look. Okay, I did it. That is everything 100% in Mario Odyssey. Unless they announce DLC in like a day or something. You know, we might get an October Direct, you never know. But as long as that's not happening, Mario Odyssey is finished. Roll the bloody credits. Mario Odyssey is a game me and many others have been waiting for for years. Ever since the game took a more linear approach, this sandbox style has sorely been missed, so to finally have a game like this in my hands was something quite special. Unlike many of these other return to forms, Nintendo managed to craft a game I'd argue is on par, if not far better than the originals. Sure, there will always be a certain charm to the scuffed models of 64 that this game can't emulate, but that's a small price to pay for the much superior gameplay. Let me tell you, the movement of this game is some of the best I have ever seen. I almost wish this game was the one getting a sequel over Breath of the Wild because of how perfect the system is. It truly would be such a shame for all of that to go to waste. Seriously, it feels like they took the same approach as 64 where they completely perfected Mario's movement before going to any of the level design parts. Speaking of Mario 64, there sure are a lot of references to it in here, as well as a lot of other games from all over the Mario series, except for the RPGs. This game is an absolute love letter to fans, I tell ya. From the costumes, to the motifs worked into a bunch of the songs, to the big musical number, it was crafted, most likely by Mario fans, for Mario fans. Seriously, they hid references everywhere, such as the options menu playing the music from Rosalina's Observatory. And the three moon animations, each being a reference to rock, paper, scissors. Okay, it's actually referenced to the first three main Mario 3D games collecting animation that just so happens to align with rock, paper, scissors, but anyway. The costumes are a major area where you see a lot of references. Even the most tiny, minor things I might get referenced. A advertisement for the Satellaview, a system which was exclusive to Japan, yep, that's been referenced. A small handful of art depicting Mario in an explorer's outfit for Mario Picross. Yeah, sure, chuck that in there. Waluigi, here he is. Even the costumes that aren't a reference to anything still feel like they would have appeared in something at some point. Like the Spaceman outfit. I could definitely see that being in a trailer for, I don't know, Mario shoes. The game, like all other games, does have its faults, however. Such as, due to the high amount of moons, there's bound to be some stinkers in there, which I have well shown in this video. The soundtrack is, admittedly, quite forgettable, and the locales we visit, while good and varied, still follow along quite closely to the whole, you know, generic Mario worlds. Sure, the city, ruined kingdom, which we barely got to explore, and luncheon are all pretty new ideas, and the way they presented Bowser's kingdom is entirely different to the way it's been seen before, are quite unique, but you still end up going to a desert, albeit red now, and a lake, and a beach, and all of the other ones you'd expect. Also, the sticking to motion controls, sometimes it is done well, like shaking your controller to make you go up a pole faster. You know what, fair enough. If I am angry and want to get somewhere faster, I probably would start shaking something. That's a smart one, Nintendo. But all the movements for Cappy, which are locked behind exclusively motion controls, is just really irritating. 
Or sometimes they aren't locked behind them, but you have to do a weird controller movement that's just not worth it. But even with all those admittedly tiny nitpicks, this game is still fantastic. There's a reason why I called it Best Game Ever in all caps back when I did a pretty shoddy Let's Play of it. And there's a reason I've dedicated this song of video to it today. And a reason why I keep replaying the game. And a reason why I bring it up to friends. Look, there's a reason for all these things. And it's that this game is great. I very much urge you to pick it up if you have the chance. So, all in all, I give it four shoes out of five. Oh, thank Christ, it's finally over. Yeah, I've been working on this video for a very, very long time. You can tell from all the jokes right up when you get, Hey, look, I recorded this clip like 12 million years ago. I've wanted to make another video like this, like the Idiot Reviews Super Mario Galaxy, for a long time now. And as you can tell, my video making skills have drastically improved since that video. So, in the future, I do want to make a lot more of these, but nowhere near this big, okay? I knew Mario Odyssey was going to be a big game to talk about, but I did not really anticipate how much to talk about. It's not just talking about each kingdom. No, no. You've also got to talk about, you know, revisiting them, getting every single moon in them. you got to talk about the bad ones, the good ones, all that. you got to talk about how to make money, because of course you do. you got to talk about the cautions. you got to talk about literally everything. Yeah. I Once again, I do want to make another one of these. I'm going to attempt to make one of these a month. But once again, it's going to be, like, nowhere near as big as Odyssey. Till next summer. So, yeah. There you go. There's the video. Uh, if you've managed to stick to through the whole thing, or have skipped to the end, well done. You know, pressing the end of the recording line. Pretty difficult video line, sorry. But yes. All done. The video's finished. Really hope you enjoyed it. Hope to make more in the future. Please like if you liked it or want to come back to it. Please subscribe if you watch a couple or the entirety of this, because this is like eight videos glued together. And yeah. Okay, the video's over now. Bye-bye. <laughs>